right. Hey, Eminem released a new single and we got a new podcast going. How's it going? Hi. Uh, <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, some things never change. People seem to think now that Eminem is trying to be offensive to get attention. And where were these people? Tell me you were ago? Tell me you were not a conscious living being before 2003 without telling me. The amount of people that are like, oh man, he made a joke about Megan Thee Stallion. I'm like, did you ever listen to Kim? The song where he openly talks in, talks about beating the shit out of him and killing his wife. Or the one song where he talked about knocking up his own mother to give himself a new brother. Like, did, did any of that crap? Uh, no, I mean, he like, used to be one of the scariest guys in music before he made Dadcore. Like, what? He's not making dad core. Don't even try that. It's Limp Biscuit and a half, and he's nowhere near that. I, I like, don't know. Dude. What is the, this is one problem I have. Literally, if someone looks at you the wrong way, something's offensive. If anyone actually thinks that Eminem is doing this to get attention, your brain is fried. The man doesn't care. And he brought back. This, this is like, we'll get in the buy or sell right after this the man openly said hey i'm bringing back slim shady one more time i'm bringing it back just to get rid of it and get rid of that pace of my career astounding applause eminem got soft even though he made mgk literally switch music genres because he beat him down so badly he's gotten <laughs> so soft i can't stand the soft crap that eminem is putting out he puts out one song. It has a bunch of racially insensitive and possibly transphobic remarks on it. Surprise Pikachu face from the same people. <laughs> what do you think Slim Shady was? <laughs> like, huh? <laughs> Fucking what? This is weak shit compared to what he used to say. Seriously. I, I just, this is I, the I Paw Patrol of Feminine lyrics. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, honestly, the, 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 the way he did with Rihanna was, like, more hardcore than, like, the shit he said. Like, I'm gonna fucking like, burn down your house and set it like, on fire because I hate you and this our relationship is dead. And that was not even as Slim Shady. That was before he did, like, back in the day, the lighter songs of his were back where he's talking about shoving a gerbil in his ass. Like, that was light lyrics. And his motivational songs were literally creating a word for the dictionary called Stan about a psychotic fan who's obsessed with him and then locks his pregnant girlfriend in a trunk and drives her off a bridge. <laughs> and that's considered motivational. <laughs> but yeah, don't worry. The generation that thought the cool thing to do was to eat fucking Tide Pods is going to cancel Eminem. Yeah, let's go Jeez. with that one. I'll never forget when Gronk said, hey, kids, yo, don't eat Tide Pods. <laughs> and you, know what, you know what started that? I can track it back. I know this is a tangent, but, like, you know when the whole Hawaiian pizza thing, like, really went off where everyone literally considered you the spawn of Satan if you put a Hawaiian pizza... Well, you put pineapple on a pizza, you are. But anyway, going on, that then became this picture that I'll never forget. They're like, if you thought Hawaiian pizza would be bad, just imagine if it was this. And it was a fucking pizza full of Tide Pods. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, that's dumb. I remember that being a meme that came across my Facebook literally a hundred times. I'm like, haha, that's funny. A news report a week later about a kid puking because he ate a fucking Tide Pod. So another damn thing that Hawaiian pizza did was suck. <laughs> and, and you know what? As a pineapple pizza defender, I'm like, y'all are just stupid. <laughs> and guess what? I also like to eat peeps because I am evil. Okay, now that's I'll eat, No, and I'll eat the peeps and I'll put a fucking candy corn on top of it. I <laughs> mean radiated foam. What are you doing? Yeah, first of all, here's the thing where people fuck up with peeps. You don't take that shit out of I the package and like, them. you it. Fuck up. No, 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 because people think, oh, you put it outside the basket. I'm like, no, then it's gonna go stale, you stupid jackass. 
Oh no, because it tastes so much better otherwise. <laughs> That's one I, I just, I can't get it. I have tried a peep in every form imaginable. And I feel like I'm eating a deceased relative every time I bite into one. Like, I just, there's nothing evil about peeps or candy corn. Okay. You're bringing up the second worst kind off the bat? If candy corn, we're going to bring back up Limp Biscuit again. If candy corn and peeps were anything, it was the cover of Behind Blue Eyes by freaking Limp Biscuit. Oh, Jesus. Jesus that Christ. is the equivalent in music. What are you nerds talking about now? This woman is trying to defend peeps as a good source of food, and she's wrong. No, I'm right. You just don't think as galaxy brained as I do. It's calm down. You're both awful. No, you, I gotta <laughs> ask Umbrian, how old are you? And how old do you think I am? But Brock, you might be right that I am the spawn of Satan because honestly, that kind of tracks. Well, you are in a room on fire. You think I'm just about 28 or you're just about 28? <laughs> you're 30. Close. You're off by two years. I won't tell you which direction. It's up. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. So. We're going to go into buy or sell to kick, kick down the avalanche of shit that kind of started coming Especially in our Especially like the last 24 hours. We're like, haha, we'll make this by leak weekly so the episodes are shorter. God said no. <laughs> I tell you, I started this podcast after literally modeling it after a podcast that goes weekly and is three hours long. <laughs> but uh, anyway, all right. So this is going to be our little bio, buy or sell segment here where basically I'm just going to break up a topic and everyone's going to just say buy or sell and a little blurb after that just to get through kind of smaller topics. One of them is there's a couple of gaming related ones and it's mostly everything else. But all right. So recently there was two new... Uh, CEOs for Sony that put through now that Jim Ryan is gone. And uh oh, it's Herman Hiltz and oh, here you I'm blanking on the second guy's name. But one is in charge of like the actual technology side and all of that, and then one is in charge of just looking over the studios and like the things like Last of Us where it's at all that, like getting around. And one statement that he said is it's never been more important for the leadership at SIE to take a step back and not be so overly controlling. So, buy or sell, Bree is, I think, the only other one that's really a gamer here. <laughs> oh, I am the gamers to gamers, not really. Uh, well, first of all, if you once you get past the PR, like, visage, like, this statement, it's like, it's saying everything and absolutely nothing, in my opinion. So, like, in theory, I would be, like, a buy, but I'm like, is it as bad as... Xbox right now? God, no. But I just, I'm not seeing the same levels of, like, excitement. And I just, I don't think this is, like, a PlayStation exclusive problem. I think it's, you know, you need to make AAA gaming. It's a cost under $200 million. And there is a bigger problem that I didn't get to mention last week that I'm not going to go on a big tangent, but I'm going to mention it here. Not buying a new console is also a good thing and a bad thing. Because it's okay that you can't afford a new console. It's perfectly fine. But you are then not allowed to bitch that new games are not running at higher frame rates, trying new shit, or expanding the things within them. Because they still need to make that some bitch work on the old console. So you cannot be complaining about these things if we are. But Brock, if, if we don't, if gamers don't complain, then what identity do they have? It is, and it's like if you can't get a console, that's fine. It's just that at some point, and I understand it's the economy, it's whatever. But at this point, everyone was kicked to the curb in the last generation by a by about a half a year. It was already everyone was fully on, and now everyone's bitching that games aren't running at sixty and eight thousand frames per second. 
we need to realize that until we actually fully embrace a new fucking console, it's not going to happen. And also another thing that's in there we're going to do is, you're right, PlayStation is great. They just, everyone does the same stupid shit. I will be honest with you. I think some studios are a lot more honest about it. PlayStation is more honestly stupid, in my opinion. It's gotten slightly better in statements since Jim Ryan's gone. Because Jim Ryan will just come out and say a thing and be like, I know it's dumb, but I fully believe in it. Versus we'll get Uncle Phil who says everything's fine until I change my opinion five minutes from now when the fans don't like what I said. But anyway, moving on. <laughs> One thing that, to preface this, in uh, Ghost of Tsushima, the character that I'm about to mention, I believe is in his 30s. I believe. I could be horribly wrong. But Hiroyuki Sonata is in talks to starring in Chad Stalinsky's Ghost of Tsushima movie. The guy looks like he's more in tune to play the father or grandfather in this than the main character who's meant to be the kid inheriting everything, deciding where he wants to go to be an honorable samurai or the ghost. So buy or sell, just I guess the fact that Sonata wants to, that is going to be starring in the movie, Mike. Oh, that's that's an easy buy. Like, I honestly don't care who he's playing as long as he's in, as long as he's in the movie somewhere, then that's a win. Yeah, yes. honestly, let the dude get his bag. I'm um, just, because he is so fucking good in Shogun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yes, he is. All right, so that I think this is the last gaming related one. All right, Mike. I guess I'll go first. But well, actually, I guess I'll go brief first. Because again, I don't know if Mike if Mike was playing. I don't think he ever had an Xbox. I would imagine. But Microsoft is reportedly, and this is a rumor from The Verge, is reportedly working on a remastered version of Halo Combat Evolved that is potentially going to be released on PS5 as well. This one, I actually have an opinion on i mean it's good for halo fans but in terms of what we're talking about i would say sell because this is just more evidence that um xbox as an ecosystem is kind of going through three free fall right now like i just they lack any sort of like concrete identity and you know halo you know something that they really you know supposedly like their company mascot Barely even more it ain't. touch. Well, yeah, we'll more it ain't. Um, but yeah, it just I don't think there's anyone there that well knows played. what they're doing. <laughs> Very I, nice, I, I, but to me, this, this says two things. One, it's that Xbox is a platform they're more or less kind of giving up on. But the second thing it tells me is that they're doing remakes. They're not making a new Halo game. They're just going to remaster what they already have. Yeah, it's one of those things where, and we'll get into a comment later on, that I got a bad feeling, and some insiders have said it too, that eventually it's just going to be called Microsoft Gaming. Oh, that sounds... And that they're just going to be a third-party publisher, eventually. I, I've never even really been an Xbox guy, but that still just sounds... Uh, to me, it's Bad. Shades of Sega. Like, this is just going to be, you know, millennial Sega crashing and burning, where Sega's just now a publisher. Yeah. All right. Anyway. So, uh, I'm fitting as I'm playing Destiny on my PS5. Mike, I assume you really don't have too much of it, so I guess we'll just go on from that. All right. Mike, I'll start with you, which I'm assuming is going to be a giant fucking buy. The new Arcane trailer. <laughs> um... <laughs> It is a huge fucking buy, <laughs> but with an asterisk that this is the final season of Arcane. Of Arcane. I'm 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 glad you brought that up too because I even said this elsewhere. Don't don't think for a second that the studio behind this show doesn't want to do more League of Legends spinoffs. Nice, and Bree. Buy or sell? Uh, buy. And uh, Riot and Fortiche have always been honest that this was supposed to be a prequel. And then after the success of Arcane, they've been very open and honest about wanting to explore the other aspects of League of Legends. And I kind of feel like this is a good point to 
uh, stop because it's just supposed to be the origin story is of Avi and mm-hmm. Jinx. And I'm like, how much more do you really you have to much. set off? And what my favorite thing about this is, is I know is, what I you're going to say. <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell where the split happens between people that know where Vi goes and people that don't know where Vi goes because this whole trailer's going on and it's fine. They're like, yeah, we're okay with Vi possibly having sex with a hot lady cop. But Vi putting on a police uniform? Fuck that horse shit. Despite the fact that it's shown that in the game, if you played it, that she becomes an enforcer. Yeah. And that's know, part of her story from the start. Look, I don't even play League because I have self-respect, but I Same. even fucking knew that. You know, hmm, Vi the Enforcer, Piltover's finest. I wonder what their arc's gonna be. But on a serious note, I'm kind of interested since uh, Arcane seems to be uh, like the new canon because League and like canon lore is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> so that's the thing with Riot, though. They've talked. This is like the decade long trying to get this thing made. They have had lore for League of Legends that they've been weaving to wait to actually make a show of, and they just sprinkled horseshit into League. So. They finally just got, here's the concrete thing that the show is there and you can basically get what you need with two or three minor details changed. The big thing will be, which, spoiler alert, everyone, in League, and I only know this from friends, Vi has amnesia and doesn't remember a damn thing from her childhood. Mm -hmm. Like, she does not know that Jinx is her sister. Yeah, I'm kind of curious if they uh, keep that or... Because I know in some of the more recent lines, they kind of make more direct references to Arcane. So I'm kind of curious if that ends up staying in in the game or not. Mm-hmm. And it's just, I, I have a good feeling that at the end of this, that whether they do the thing or not, it's going to end with a flash forward of those two looking, everyone looking how they look more closely in current, whatever. It's just going to be lifelines of people, which is fine. They're going to have to come up with a good title to link all this stuff. I just have a feeling it's going to become a League of Legends tale. Because you can't just do all these and then people are like, oh, it's League of Legends. You're going to have to have some sort of connector. And Well, that, that's, anyway, that's, that's probably why they put League of Legends at the end of this trailer. Yeah. But speaking well, of that, also something I'm very happy about. Buy or sell, Brie first. G-Kids acquiring the home video rights to Arcane. Uh, the biggest fucking buy and the fact that it's getting a 4K release too makes me so happy because I refuse to pay for 4K Netflix. <laughs> and Mike, I assume sell? <laughs> no, no, this is this is a big buy. This is a buy for G-Kids more, more so than anything else because they, 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 they are really doing a great job getting into the home video market. And I hope I hope Netflix does more of this. Well, do, here's my question. I'm not sure if Netflix fully owns the show or if they're just like the distributor. I'm not sure if Netflix actually has like a stake into it. It might just all be Riot. I'm not sure if that's ever been like really made clear. Oh, that's a good that's a good point. I'm not actually sure how much stake they have. <laughs> the League of Verse. League of Verse. Nice. <laughs> They'll call it the lull verse. I mean, I, I mean, if we're being honest, <laughs> so, so they'll just call it lulls arcane, lulls blah blah. <laughs> hey, Manny. Or, or AKA South Korea's national pastime. <laughs> South Korea's entire economy, outside of Starcraft. <laughs> All right, so and this is going to sound funny to anyone that watched Supernatural. The boys written and created show ran, I guess, by Eric Kripke will end with season five, and that was the original plan. Buy or sell, Mike? I I buy that Eric Kripke believes this. I don't buy that Amazon and Sony believes this. I think I think what's what's gonna happen is a repeat of Supernatural where season five comes out. Um, premieres to like huge numbers Amazon and Sony are like hey um, let's do more of this here's the thing oh, we'll let Brie but, go first but, they, fire, but first do they go to super hell <laughs> good lord 
buy or sell? Uh, uh kind of like sell. I mean, I'm not really super into the boys. Like, I know I'm like probably like on everyone's hit list because of that, but I'm like, I have so much shit to do. I <laughs> just, but. Yeah, I kind of think this is bullshit. I mean, yeah, Gen V is going to go on, su supposedly. Um, but I definitely see a situation where it'd be like, after three years, like, hey, guess what? We're back, bitches. <laughs> the thing here is, I, again, if I was Amazon here, I would almost imagine that Kripke, after the horseshit that happened with Supernatural, which everyone needs to remember... If anyone watched the last episode of season five of Supernatural, there's a very clear 30 seconds that are tacked on to make that thing have a season six. That if it wasn't there, would have ended how Kripke wanted. And Kripke left the show. He didn't keep running it. That's a real clear inconception that they're like, well, he didn't stop it. It wasn't his choice. He left because he didn't want to do it anymore. I could see with this where it's like, wow, you got really good five seasons. Do you have another fucking show that you'd like to make that's just as big? Because at this point, they're going to run out of comic material if they make it to season five. And Kripke's not is adapting. He's not making new shit up. He's not. And if they lose Kripke, they're going to realize that, oh, wait, what happened on the other one? Oh, wait, it was shit for two years until they found a better showrunner. I didn't make something else. Honestly, and I know it's not perfect, Amazon's pretty good at doing shit well it's, it recently. Mm -hmm. You're looking at their run of shows, if you're going to compare it to anything else, they kind of just let the shit go. And if they're going to do anything, Gen V could very easily be the other thing because I don't know if there's Gen V comics or what it is, but I think Gen, Gen V is like pretty off. original. You ain't gonna have shit to go off of on the other one because if you get rid of, guess what? If you go through with it and you get rid of Homelander, show's done. I don't care if there was comics after it. The show is Homelander and Billy Butcher, and Billy Butcher has super cancer, and Homelander's gonna die. So. I love the rest of the characters. I'm not watching a show that doesn't have them in it. <laughs> that that's that's why I think Eric Kripke is pretty firm on this being the final season. Hey, hey, Umbreon, they already broke canon with that dude. Homelander is originally uh, home, uh, what's her name? What's the Nazi bitch's name? Oh, um, Stormfront. Yeah, Stormfront also originally a man and the father of Homelander. In this show, he fucks Stormfront as a side chick, and Soldier Boy is his dad. So, we can't have that as canon. We can't say, oh, well, they can't do the thing. To no. <laughs> and they're bringing in a new noir, who is the person who killed them originally in the comics. So, they're, 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 noir they're, they're, they're going be, way off, off the beaten path. Yeah, which the new noir might go back to being a Homelander clone because they killed off the original that wasn't a Homelander clone. In the comics, there never was two noirs. It was just one who was a clone of Homelander that did all the sketchy shit that Homelander gets accused of, including all the shit with Billy Butcher's wife. That was all him. Homelander wasn't a great person, but all the really sketchy shit he got accused of, the clone did. And they get brought up at the White House, and then Homelander goes fucking nuts because he realized all the shit he's accused of was a clone. The show is way off the reservation at this point, and I'm letting you know now, 99.9% .9 of the people that read the comics agree the show is way way better because of it. Yep, that track. This is most one of the best adaptations of anything ever. <laughs> Alright. Buy or sell... <laughs> I love this statement so much. Buy or sell, Mike. Ian McKellen, when asked if he's interested in returning for Gandalf for for the Hunt of the Gollum movie, if I'm still alive, <laughs> <laughs> I, I buy that just because it made me laugh. <laughs> I, I, I love Ian McKellen so goddamn much. <laughs> so pretty, buy or sell. <laughs> ah, at this point, like buy. I guess. I I mean. 
first of all, I'm like, why are we even here? Well, I mean, I know why we're here, but... You want to talk about rubbing oh, Contra yeah. dry. <laughs> Milk in that whole tea. But anyway. <laughs> Speaking of the boys. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, which, by the way, that new uh, Lord of the Ring anime thing looks cool. I just... It does. Oh, we'll get into that. That's on the docket. But, I mean, look, if they're going to do this, like, and he's still around and he wants to do it, I'm like, yeah, why not? I mean, the fact that this movie's even going to exist is, like, ridiculous because we thought, you know, The Hobbit built everything dry, but we're like, nope, we can do more because we are Warner Discovery. <laughs> Yeah, I, they're going to make a whole three movies out of something that, from what I'm told from people that read the books, maybe could last a half a movie. <laughs> anyway, on to something, you know, that's less troubling. Mike, buy or sell that Sony bought Alamo Draft House. <laughs> my, my thoughts are actually a little bit more complicated. On the one hand... Part of me want, wants to sell because just the idea of a movie studio owning owning a theater chain is kind of shady, and I don't I don't trust I don't trust what they plan to do with that moving forward. But at the same time, technically, and even after. Um, the Paramount decree was overturned back in 2020. Mm -hmm. Even 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 before that, Sony technically could have owned a theater this whole time because they weren't they weren't one of the one of the big five that were mentioned in in that uh, in that law back in 1948. Jesus, <laughs> God, Lord. <laughs> I just, I mean, uh, the only like bright side I see is that at least Alamo is out outside of like you know being owned by like hedge funds or like private equity, nah. but also like good luck to anyone trying to unionize. I mean, it just the whole thing of like the theater industry right now is just honestly kind of shit. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna take that as a sell from you then. <laughs> Eh, probably a sell. I, I just, I have, like, complicated feelings. I, and this just might be, like, a me thing, but just all, like, the discourse, you know, or surrounding, like, cinemas and, like, movies and TV, I'm just, like, kind of, like, it's, done it's, with it's it. All, it's all a mess. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is. But anyway, something that's likely not going to be a mess. Uh, Brie, buy or sell the Venom Last Dance trailer. Nay, Venom for horse girls. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say this right now. That Venom horse is one of the coolest looking things in a comic book movie in a long fucking time. Yes. No, the one thing I do like about the Venom movies is that they don't give a shit. And like, honestly, the Venom movies aren't what I would call like high art. But at least they're fun. It's not like a miserable slog. Are you trying to I tell think... me that Venom having an existential crisis about his partner going to a rave wasn't high art to you? <laughs> it felt... I mean, they're going to be together forever, but I'm kind of glad that they are ending it here. I mean, there are three ho hopefully really solid popcorn movies. The rest can not be said about Sony's... <laughs> Brony self side. I will um, have you know that me and Mike watched Madam Web and I'm barely alive. <laughs> that, that, I'm that saying, was I, a movie. Was it even technically a movie? <laughs> it, it, mean, it, it was on film. It, 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 <laughs> is, it is the legal definition of movie. Okay, but going off of that, I mean, the Venom movies have been like the only like Sony thing that's been like, okay, you know, is it a little bit out of date with modern superhero standards? Yeah, probably. That doesn't mean that they're not fun, but I'm kind of glad that they're ending it here and it's not overstaying its welcome. Yeah. Mike, buy or sell? I, I buy for, for, for the horse alone. <laughs> but, yeah, honestly, I just like how, like, 
carefree these movies are and Tom Hardy just going completely cuckoo puffs in that role. This this version of Venom is one of my favorites just for how brutally honest they make the Venom symbiote. Mm-hmm. Like in the second movie when he, when when Carnage shows up and he sees them in the theater and he goes yeah, to you, Father. Holy shit! And he <laughs> reverts back. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. And then when he's on the plane and he sees that, like, Quadra Frank Gawler just goes, Jesus Christ! And he goes running away. But, you know what? If anything, I feel like the Venom movies have more than apologized for whatever the hell Spider-Man 3 was supposed to be. I mean, is it the best version of Venom? Probably not not but again these movies are a lot of fun and like ultimately harmless oh, if, oh, if you want the best version of venom you have to watch spectacular spider-man well yeah that 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 is pretty out there but i will tell you what <laughs> the fact that i got a version of eddie brock sitting down in a church praying for god to kill peter parker that moment i'll never forget <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just love, I, I, I just love how we had a studio go. All right, we need a slightly, slightly bulkier guy who could intimidate Peter Parker and make the Venom symbiote look like it'd be an imposing force. Who I know. Eric Foreman. Topher Grace. Yeah, Eric show. Foreman. <laughs> who in that <laughs> office didn't go? The dumbass from that '70s show. That kid. Like, we could have anyone else. Anyone. We could have J.K. Simmons play Venom, and it would be more believable. Topher Grace. Was no one else available. I love Topher Grace, but Venom? He should have been here. That's like, he's more appropriate for Harry Osborn. Mm -hmm. And you know, in an alternate timeline, that probably would have happened. (laughs) Ay, ay, ay. All right, so another small gaming one. Buy or sell, I guess, Brie first. Silent Hill remake to producer admits Konami wanted to make a litany of changes, but Blooper Team resisted. Oh, Konami, fuck you, <laughs> first of all. But yeah, I, you know what the weird th- thing is, is that, and I'm not sure if this exactly pertains to this, but everything I've seen about the Silent Hill 2 and like, over like correcting it 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 just it's so weird and like even people who were i I don't want to get political or more like left-leaning they're like no these changes are stupid and 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 dumb it's just the one thing that kind of grinds my ass about modern gaming is that we're like over correcting stuff i'm like you're allowed to have characters to be sexy the issue was you made all of them that one body type. We didn't say, no, you can't do this ever again. Because women game too. Women like that stuff. And mm-hmm. I just, people don't understand. The issue is you need a diversity of body types and looks. Not that, oh, she's so in cleavage and too much skin. So I'll take that as you buy that they're not three <laughs> just... It... Silent Hill fan- fans just wanted to look at Pyramid Head's ass and just have a nice remaster. I, I don't think they wanted this. <laughs> Mike, I don't know if you have too much of an opinion on Silent Hill, but... Um, all, all, all I can really say is good luck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll have Mike go first. Mike, buy or sell that Sean Levy might be directing Avengers 5. Sure, why not? I buy this. <laughs> because he works well with an ensemble. And that's basically what all these Avengers movies are. Mm-hmm. Like, pe- people who are getting upset about this choice need to take a look at who directed the other Avengers movies. Not, not, like, I, I, I love those movies, but none of the filmmakers have ever been, like, top-shelf talent. No, they're like, can you do, do this job in a reasonable manner because i wouldn't call the russo brothers you know the auteurs of our time no absolutely not (laughs) no it's it's a kevin feige show and it's like look you just have to make sure all the cogs going together 
And I mean, that's one of the biggest criticisms of like the MCU. And I think that's valid to an extent. But to be fair, I think for some of the smaller films, maybe not so much in phase four, but in the past, like there's definitely still, you know, their own individualistic identity. And to say that they don't is just completely and utterly false. But, you know, I guess Marvel, like right now, they just seem to be going through a little bit of an identity crisis. So I think anyone that can kind of like steer them into more known waters and kind of get them through this transitional period. I mean, look, as long as they can do their job, I really honestly don't care. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Gotcha. All right, I guess I'll have Bree go first. Uh, first trailer for the Lego Pharrell Williams biopic. Ah, bye, because... Uh, thank Christ we're getting a music biopic that isn't, like, the same melodramatic shit that's, like, okay. so, like, you know, if I looked at a piece of cardboard, I'd be more emotionally engaged. And, you know, the fact that it's Pharrell, I'm like, of course it would be him. But the thing that, that I probably like the most is this is, like, a good use of celebrity casting because they're playing themselves. And that is, like, such a creative idea that I'm kind of... It's weird that no one's ever done that before. And it's really interesting that this is the first Lego movie that Universal makes on their uh, new contract since uh, WB's rights uh, lapsed from the Lego group. It's interesting. Mike, buy or sell? Oh, I, I very buy this. And just to add more to the filmmaking side of things, this is directed by Morgan Neville, who did the incredible Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Oh, that's so So th this, this is a, a great combination of, of documentary and animation and Lego animation specifically. So yeah, this is, this is all around a but winner you know, for me. But you know what I'm really super curious about, Mike? So Gwen Stefani's in this. I'm just curious, like, how much they're going to cover of, like, Holla Back Girl. Because Holla Back Girl is literally one of the most hilarious songs written in history when you learn the context of, like, why it exists. <laughs> so, Brock, do you know the backstory of, like, Holla Back Girl? I do not. Okay, to make a long story short, uh, Courtney Love basically got into a beef with Gwen Stefani that she was making, like, bubblegum pop music or whatever. So... 35, 36 year old Gwen Stefani, Stefani decides she's going to make a diss track. And then she, Pharrell comes up with this, you know, high school like band stuff. And if you want to ever feel the heat of a nuclear blast of like, this is 2004, watch the music video for Holla Back Girl, where Gwen Stefani literally says, and I quote, Oh, so kawaii! <laughs> Yeah. No, 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 watch it. I'm like, it is literally like you just get like full in your face. Like it is like a full on like nuclear blast of like holy shit. <laughs> that was one song that anytime I heard it in middle school, I wanted to put a gun to my head. So, I think but I'll she, but you. Gwen taught us how to spell the word bananas. <laughs> I was aware beforehand. <laughs> And I'll be aware afterwards. <laughs> All right. I don't think that these are both actors that I have not heard of. So I don't know if I'm excited about this or not. But A, the Watch Dogs film that I keep forgetting is a thing because I didn't know it was a thing. Buy or sell that Tom Blythe is going to star in it opposite Sophie Wilde. Mike. I I buy this for, for both of them. Um, so for those who don't know, Tom Blythe was in the most recent Hunger Games movie. And uh, Sophia Wilde was in a horror film directed by, I don't know if you know the YouTube group uh, Raka Raka. I do not. Um, I know the old diss artist named Raka Raka Ali. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, anyway um, Sophia Wilde was in a movie last year called Talk to Me, which is 
a really cool sort of it, it, it's a horror film that involves um I'll, I'll i'll show you the trailer later but she's re- she's really good in it and if if these are, if this is like the caliber of actors they're looking for for this project then i got a good feeling about whatever this turns out to be but she looked really good covered in tattoos with a side shave probably all right, I'm just figuring about who I think she was, think they're gonna have her play. Uh, Bree, by herself. I don't know if you played Watch Dogs or not. I I don't. I'm just gonna go off with Mike. I'm like at this point, I'm like I don't care. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Gosh. All right, one last by herself, and I don't know how reputable this is, but I saw it as a rumor, and they have all the people available. Buy or sell, Brie, that the Young Avengers film will reportedly start filming in 2025. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. It just... here, Here's the thing, at least with me. It just, it seems like they keep going and resetting, like, constantly. That if... Thunderbolts sees 2025 between all the research, like, I'll be legitimately surprised. Because I feel like this is just something that Disney and a lot of the other big studios are just, you know, I mean, even going to later, like, Cartoon Network, like, I just, I think people are just throwing shit at the wall and hoping, you know, what sticks. I mean, if it films, it's great. My only issue is now it's been like so long in between like Disney Plus shows. Is anyone legitimately gonna care? I mean, if it's good, I'll care. If it's marketed good and it says it's good by people that are reviewing it, yes. Mike, you um, seem to have thoughts. <laughs> yes. Well, couple couple things. One, <laughs> Thunderbolts has wrapped filming, mm-hmm. so. I'm more than positive that it will make its 25, 2025 release date. As as far as this rumor, they they didn't specify when in twenty twenty five. So this could mean anything from they film in the summer. It could mean December thirty first. <laughs> yeah, it, it it could it could be anything. I. I am taking every single Marvel rumor, including some that we'll be talking about later today. I'm kind of taking all of it with a grain of salt until two things. One, Comic-Con, which is next month. And two, D23, which is in August. So until, until those things start to like crystallize their announcements, I, I I I take I take nothing at face value. Gotcha. <clears throat> All right, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're gonna start out with some gaming related news, and I'm gonna go with skip one or two over. So, Call of D- Mike, an average big game used to be like a hundred gigs. And that was considered a lot. Call of Duty, which is just a game filled with maps that people shoot each other in. And keep in mind that Google Flight Simulator that has a map of the fucking planet is 150. Black Ops 6 is 300 gigs at launch. That is, And it's classified as DLC on Steam. I'm sorry, what? That's just insane bullshit. That's another reason. I'm like, ha, compression, what does that mean? No one knows how to anymore. No one knows how to compress a damn thing. What is going on in this game that it needs 300 gigs? What is going on? That, people bitched that you could only get like three or four games in a system because now it's the it's got the two the terabyte hard drive almost half of your terabyte half this when it's done will likely take up an entire hard drive of a stock system in this generation ridiculous and it's not needed at all 
there's like 15 maps and you shoot around online. This same game was maybe 60 gigs two console generations ago. And it's and not because they need to look that much better, because they don't. What is it? But here's, like, the thing, too, is that, like, in theory, you could probably get, you know, for, like, 300 gigabytes, you could probably get, like, most of the Nintendo Switch library for, like, the last two years on, like, the same amount of space. Like, it's just, it's fucking ridiculous. It's... Because it's like, why buy, buy a game? Which, by the way, according to some parties, um, so you don't actually own it. So in theory, if it's just like a DLC code and it's not like an actual content on a disc, then you just spent, what, like $70, $80 for a one-time thing that you're never going to play again? Like, what the fuck is that about? Yeah, that's good old Ubisoft there for get used to not owning your games. I'm like, cool. I just yo ho yo ho a pirate's life for uh, me <laughs> anyway so also and i've been told by people that were at this event that they were told to cheer for everything but at a local ign event or a post that was mostly by ign where they were interviewing phil spencer about taking away people's jobs from a successful company they told the crowd to cheer through like a sitcom fucking sign everything's fine <laughs> and phil spencer dodges the question by going i need to run a successful company and need to make hard choices okay then why Take did you get cut. rid of a company that was successful <laughs> why did you spend almost just shy of a hundred billion dollars on a company that you didn't need I don't think those are good business decisions, Philip. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And then after that, in an interview, he's at, after Xbox is in a really good place, that mo more, more Xbox first party games are coming to other platforms, says Xbox boss Phil Spencer. You're going to see more of our games on more platforms. We just see that as a benefit to franchises that we're building. What franchises did you That's build? That's like, Phil? which ones? I'm like, where, like... Call where of Duty? They? Skyrim? All these companies that you went... Oh, that's really successful. What if we just owned that? Thanking the audience. Yeah, thanking that the audience lost their humanity. It is better, but I'm sorry to tell you... You could have dropped a grand in front of me. I'm not cheering for a guy that said, yeah, it was a really good choice to fire that successful company because I can't actually think of what to do. And I can't take a pay cut or take responsibility for my leadership decisions. No, it's the no. workers that are the problem, not the fact that I need a third yacht. No, and not the fact that Sarah Bond, who, God, I had faith. Sarah, I was so excited that New Blood was going into that management team, and then you shat all over it by doing a 10-minute spiel about game preservation and then announcing three all-new, all-digital consoles. Game preservation? That's not how that works, Sarah. Nope. I just, I just don't know I... why their messaging is, like, so all over the place. I'm like, it's honestly, I'm looking at it from a communication standpoint, I'm like... Like, what the hell is going on? Do they even have a communication team? It's just, like, there just doesn't seem to be any consistent messaging at all. Because at least, you know, if you're spewing bullshit, be at least consistent in your bullshit. Yep. Uh, no, no, I agree. And that's one thing that I will say, like what I said about Sony. They will be consistently stupid. They will be dumb. I've never said Sony is a 100% smart company, but when they're stupid, they will act as if it was a smart decision. And then we'll run with it until it goes away and we'll be like, we screwed up. Kind of sometimes, but we screwed up. They won't just go, yeah, we never meant for that to happen. It was an accident. We actually had something else planned the whole time. I just, how, how do you have Matt Booty, Phil Spencer, and now Sarah Bond that all can't stop lying? At all can't stop. 
contradicting even their own other people's statements out of the three of them. They just can't stop. I want so badly for there to be good Microsoft games, and they're starting to come out with them. Stealth of Midnight, that new Perfect Dark, a lot of them look really cool. But you need to stop lying! Ay, ay, ay. Anyway, which is what's something I'm going to go on, which is one reason why, again, maybe my first, my favorite worker at all of Sony is the guy who develops her consoles, because he's the only person who I think actually likes his job there. Mark Cerny, who is the person who was the main engineer behind the PS4 and the PS5. It said point blank that when people are like, we need to make higher end PCs or whatever, he's like, I'm not making a high end PC. I'm making a console and I'm never going to plan to make anything else. Which honestly. That's what you should aim for. People mm -hmm. want counsel. The people that don't want consoles have the money to spend it on a PC. Yeah. Like no one's going to buy like a tw 12 to 800, $1,800 Sony branded PC. This is no. just not going to happen. No. And anyone who thinks that they want that is an idiot. Because if you're going to spend that much money on something, I would slap that. I am a giant Sony fanboy. If you say, yeah, I'm really thinking about buying that $1,000 PlayStation, I would slap you across the face and say, if you have the money to spend $1,000 on gaming, make your own console exact, make your own PC exactly how you want to. You can still plug a controller into it. I mean, most and, controllers use Bluetooth anyway, so, like, literally, you could put fucking anything into it. Yeah, and guess what? It's going to come to you either way. So if you're a patient person and you're willing to spend money, and most people nowadays, unless they have a really high-paying job, are patient in order to have money because you got to save it, buy a PC. I'm sorry. Anyone who has the brain malfunction to think that they are... A, if they want something that's as powerful as they think it needs to be, thinks that it could only cost like $600 is a moron, or anyone that is willing to spend that stupid amount of money, both of you are taking the wrong pills. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. Just doesn't. Ay, ay, ay. And on the same path for that is one problem that I kind of have for gaming that he's openly talked about how even he's questioning why games take six years to come out and he's the person developing the stuff for the systems that go to those people and he says i can make the system as best as i want a lot of developers are choosing to take six years to make a game that is the path that they've chosen to take this to spend all this in because there's some games that come out in easier time that look just as cool and run just as flashy they just don't have 600 hours of content in them. I can't remember who said the quote, but it was it was some developer or something that a game is never finished, a game is shipped. It's 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 kind of like the same thing with movies. A move a movie isn't finished, you're just you're just done. You're yeah, you're you're I'm editing it. Yeah. A, a movie is a movie isn't finished, it it's escaped. It's it's finished. It I mean it's the definitive version of it, but I think I mean every situation with like development isn't like carte blanche. Like this is like a singular issue that like oh if we just fix this one thing that'll make everything better. <laughs> it's just it's a lot of different complicated moving pieces. So yes, art takes time to develop and one of the biggest issues right now is these companies are selling games that like are just not ready for prime time they're buggy and messy so like i would rather have a game that i could play than having 12 trillion polygons and like real time ray chasing cuz i feel like one of the modern like issues for the majority of gaming right now is like how hyper realistic do we want to go but developing that kind of tech takes Mm -hmm. time and yeah. that often comes at expense of the actual experience which is the game which is kind of like the whole fucking point <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like my fa my favorite video game of all time until horizon came out oh speaking of what you said banjo tooie <laughs> was banjo tooie 
that's a fucking N64 game. Uh, speaking of which, just to kind of side tangent and get, uh, what do you think of that Lego Horizons trailer? <laughs> I am going to lose my entire life once that game comes out. I'm letting you know right now, I didn't think I was going to be as hyped for that game as I thought I was. Not the best game shown at that council. Killer Bean was the best thing shown at that show. <laughs> I'll show you, I'll tell you now, that and the Power Rangers beat him up that I didn't think I was going to get. <laughs> but... I am super jacked about that. And what makes it funny is that I don't think a lot of people are realizing this. That that Horizon game is coming out on literally everything but Xbox. Which, which is just... Mwah. Like, could not but write that I'm better. I'm going to be honest with you. I almost wonder, and some people have kind of hinted at this, that that might just be a Lego Nintendo thing. It, it 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 could be, but the other thing. So now you have a new version of your shirt, Brock. You don't deserve women, but it's just a giant Lego. I can head. only do it <laughs> with the character brought up. I, when when I tell y'all that I am in possible conversations to get a commissioned piece of art to put on a T-shirt with that quote under it, I'm not lying. Oh, I I commissioned. 30 different artists for the fan fiction that me and a friend wrote for six years. I have all of them in my Twitter. <laughs> what? You don't want a yassified Lego head, Brock? <laughs> no. It'll just be... I'll already tell you what it is. It's a picture of... You know the Will Smith meme where he's like... Yeah. With Jada? It's literally me and Rogue. Like, that is the that is the photo in my head. <laughs> and it's just... It's, you don't deserve women underneath it. And like I have another person that I don't know if Matthew Carnes will ever see this, but I'm telling you right now, I might commission someone to get the picture of imitating of him holding up a restraining order from Catherine Newton, like Josh holding up the restraining order. From <laughs> the <laughs> I'm this close to considering doing it. Mike knows I'll get shit commissioned for stupid reasons. We're doing uh, fresh takes on something right now that I got some stupid shit commissioned. And it turned out wonderful. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm very excited. It's it's just one of those things where it can be stupid. And I've kind of missed just playing a game that's stupid. And, like, they've got things that, like, there's... There's machines being DJs and like you're rebuilding your old village that was never a thing in the old game. It just looks like it could be so much damn fun. Just a turn your brain off and go type of thing that I wish they did with more properties other than Star Wars and Harry Potter. Legoify other big things. Like, can you imagine a Lego Gears of War game? Oh, God. Uh, just how fucking no, stupid no, 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 that would no, 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 no. be. You know what would be really s stupid? It would never happen, but in the fan fiction in my head, do Lego Cyberpunk, and then whenever, you know, V goes in, I, just I have... Play e e e e e e e e <laughs> I play the shit out of... I, I play the shit out of a... Of a you Lego know, when, you're, when they're breaking each other, <laughs> because Legos don't have to dance. Something, something <laughs> would tell me that that would not be allowed. Lego Cyberpunk Edge Runner. Oh, <laughs> I don't. I don't need that. I don't need that trauma. I don't need that trauma. Again. I don't need that again. He's edging that trauma to the not, extreme. <laughs> I don't need that ever again. <laughs> but all right. So, moving on to another topic. Uh, and this is one that's been kind of coming up in other things of like when more details about a certain game is coming out. Jason Schreier, who is a pretty, pretty reliable person on any sort of scoops period, is kind of brought up in certain articles that Sefton Hill, which is one of the heads of Rocksteady, kind of set Suicide Squad up as a shit pile toward the end and kind of just took off when it really was not being what they wanted and from the sounds of it it wasn't really rock it wasn't really Warner Brothers choice to make it a live service it was hmm. on Rocksteady's end 
it's sounding like more now. Is that it's true, not, or is that the, or is that just the narrative? No, that has been a couple of people that are more inside that are now being a lot more vocal about how the development of that game actually went. That don't care about NDAs, starting to say shit. Hmm. You know, I I, I kind of believe it because. The way I see it with, like, Warner Brothers leadership, they're like, oh, will this make us money? And Rock City going, yeah. They're like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, just, it's one of those things. But uh, on to a better note of games that I'm happy are getting remade, because, and this is another one I wouldn't mind a Lego of, Max Payne. <laughs> <laughs> the remake got a budget increase. And the production is going to begin in June 2024. Max Payne is the one that revolutionized bullet time. And the John Woo style kind of jumping and shooting in video games. And it was a very dark kind of gritty um, detective drama that was very well done. And they've been wanting to remake it for a while. But they're remaking the first two into one big game as one giant project. And... If anyone knows just how pet like I think the most genuine game developer I've ever seen in my entire life is Sam Lake, which is a guy at Remedy who just anytime he goes on stage just might be the most like I love my job, please we're making products for you and everything they make is gorgeous and well developed. So I'm pretty excited about that. So that kind of makes it look like everything with Alan Wake 2 is done after this DLC, which is fine. I just after this is done, I want Control 2, like, really, really bad. Because tag game's ridiculous. Mike, that might be the most up-your-alley type of thing to look into ever. That is something that needs a uh, Amazon TV show, mm -hmm. is Control. It is, like, these other... This company takes care of otherworldly objects that they just have them trapped in vaults. And then they do weird things. Like, I can't remember exactly how it was, but there was just a guy that had to stare at a fridge. And if you ever lost eye contact with it, I, it would either make you disappear or kill you. It's just a bunch of random shit like that. And it's, it's otherworldly and it's great. I suggest anyone who has not played Control play it. A, it's one of the best feeling games I've ever played. It's one of the creepiest games I've ever played. It's just amazing. It's so well done. It mixes live action stuff with um with the game actual game look. It's it's ridiculous. Well, that does sound cool. It it's it's so good. If that ever got made into an actual thing, anything of remedies would be good for like and I specifically Amazon because I think that they'd go full raunchy with it. Um. So we'll I'll wait until Bree gets back to do a couple more of these other things. But uh, so one thing that happened and supposedly it went bad is that uh, apparently Marvel met with uh, Jordan Peele and supposedly about X-Men and supposedly it didn't go good. Yeah, this is, this is one of those rumors that it has kind of been floating around and I I don't necessarily believe I, I don't I don't believe anything about it. Like not even not even from the fact that like okay, fine, he took a meeting. Every everyone takes a meeting in Hollywood. Like pe people have taken meetings for things they had no intention of of ever actually doing. However, there is something I do want to bring up. Um, we weren't going to include it in the buy or sell segment, but there was an article that came out in the rap earlier today about uh, Blade lost its second director. So now there, now there's a little bit of speculation of, hmm, maybe maybe Jordan Peele could be convinced to direct Blade. I don't think a movie that's going on to its third writer. Oh, they they've they've gone through like five or six different writers now but that we know about. I don't see Jordan doing that movie unless he writes it. 
I'm going to be real honest with you. Jordan's one of those directors that I see writing the films that he directs. I, yeah, that's, that's why I, that's why I don't think he's going to really be involved in any movie going forward. But if like it... X-Men would have been the one that I thought again, that they bring that up. If he was going to write any of them, X-Men sounds the most up his alley. Yeah. Yeah, but even like that, like, was it like a, a official or is it like just that's a rumor? A rumor. That is the most rumorous rumor to ever rumor. I it just it doesn't really seem like the two really would vibe. You know, half of this, you know, I'm not like gonna, you know, be like the weird nerd versus Elon Musk thing where I'm defending everything that Kevin Feige does, but. I just I feel like where Marvel is right now, it's going to be very like controlled because that's just kind of how it is right now. Not even so much because of Feige, but that's just how Disney is. You know, Disney is just not willing to take a lot of risks on stuff. And until they get it through their thick skulls that, you know, people are just going to stop just watching because you're devaluing your product. <laughs> um, I just I don't even know if that was even like a Thing that he would even take a meeting for. I mean, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but but like I said earlier, everybody take everybody takes a meeting. A me a meeting a meeting doesn't necessarily have to. It it doesn't have to mean anything. It's just it's just a meeting. Right, 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 right. I just. I I don't know. I guess it's just because the whole like direction, and I'm not you know one of those people that's like, you know, Marvel's good, you know, Marvel's, like, evil, just, because I think the whole discourse around Marvel and superhero films is, like, so blasé and old, like, it's done the death. I'm like, if the problem were just Marvel, then I, I don't think we'd be having, like, a tenth of the issues right now. Yeah, no. I love that everyone likes to talk about the quality of Marvel movies, and then be like, no, Marvel's lost its touch. I'm like, if any of you think that anything that marvel's put out is as bad as madam web y'all need to redo not even madam web because madam web had a had a plot of a seven movie stuck in a two morbius had nothing like if y'all think anything and i'm telling you right now the faith that i have that craven's good <laughs> Like, Craven seems like one of those fake movies that they have in the TV because they can't get like rights to like the actual thing. Like, here's the thing I, though <laughs> so did Morbius and Madam Web, and they came out. I, <laughs> I mean, but that's like the, the whole thing, and like, even like, just to kind of cross back to like stuff of like all the stuff of like Cartoon Network, like a bunch of stuff came out of Annecy today and it was like all reboots and stuff. I'm like, great, yeah, all these classic things are going out, but no one's doing like original I ideas or, you know, not giving stuff, you know, like Furiosa, like time to kind of like work itself out, which is just like so r ridiculous. Like it's just so many bad business decisions just really compounding into everything. And it's just, it's killing everyone. That, that's going to be a thing, though, and I mean this as a call-out. I'm sick of every single person that goes, and I'm not talking about you in this, this is a generalization of a giant problem that no one ever likes to discuss at the big level. We want original content. There's original content right there. When does the next Marvel movie come out? This. I, I, no I, one goes to see it. We wonder why everything's a fucking reboot now? Because it makes money. <laughs> Yeah, like the the other thing that frustrates me too is the like the the moving of the goalpost where people say where are all like where are all the original movies? An original movie comes out. This looks like garbage. This is woke trash. Why yeah. are they making something new? No one asked for this. You did. Yeah, and you keep seeing this shit. So if you you spitch that all the Marvel movies are the same, I'm like. Because that's what you fucking want. Yeah, and it, it's the same thing where... And this is the thing where the MCU created this problem. I think is absolute horseshit because guess what? 
there hasn't been an MCU movie out and they're still doing it to every single movie. You need to let a movie be in theaters for longer than two weeks. Mm -hmm. And the th just to kind of cross back to Furiosa, a sec, it, like here it kind of symbolizes Hollywood's problem. Furiosa, a Mad Max story. And then, yeah, Mike, I don't know if you watched the Jenny Nicholson uh, bit yet, but she goes in the part in like the beginning of the video where it's just like corporate speak. Like everything is like, I mean, yeah, movie studios and films, like they've always been a product. Like, let's just not beat around the bush here and just be perfectly honest here. But the fact that everything has to have, like, you know, this pinpointed, like, keyword phrase so it kind of pops up in search optimization, it feels soulless. It doesn't even matter if the movie's, like, good or not. It's it's just everything is just the sanitized, you know, brand-friendly bullshit. Yep. Capitalism has pretty much taken control of everything. Even Even fast food restaurants. This is, this is a slight tangent, but have you noticed how every single restaurant now looks all gray and monotone and very corporate? Yep. Yeah. And and how it is like, and they're talking about that, like that we need to make our money again. I used to get crap for going to Five Guys because my burger costed fifteen dollars. It's less expensive than a McDonald's meal I normally get now. That's insane. I tell you right now, my ass is driving 45 minutes to go get my five guys than driving the two minutes to get McDonald's. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to crack through the few other gaming things we got now that you're back here. All right. I don't know if either of you watched the Dragon Age stuff, but they've changed the name of Dragon Age Dreadwolf to Veilguard, and they showed some gameplay. And it is, it's just Mass Effect. It's even more of just Mass Effect, but medieval. And I'm going to be honest, I'm fine with that. It's not as classic of an RPG as it used to be, but the same people that used to run Bioware aren't there. So I'm okay if the newer people are doing something they would be better at than trying to be something they're not and being bad at it. Hmm. And if I just get Mass Effect again, but with spells and dwarves? I mean, it's not the worst idea in the world. It's not. It's really not. And I'm gonna be honest, we kind of got the switching it to from being more action oriented away after EA bought them, but EA gave them all the money to make all of their biggest series, so we got the one of the best trilogies of gaming with Mass Effect. So it's just kind of one of those things. Uh, and the game that I've been looking forward to, I which is um have any of you heard or seen any of the Shadow of War or Shadow of Mordor games at all? I've seen like some of some of it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that same company, things. Monolith Games, is making a Wonder Woman game, and apparently, it's not doing well. Hmm. And um, it's on uh, Monolith Games is owned by WB. I don't know if that uh, helps your. Yeah, I don't know the fact that it's a Wonder Woman <laughs> game. I don't know. Just a little bit of a tip off there. <laughs> well, it's that. But here's the thing: Shadow of Mordor, guy with sword. Blocking ability, monsters. Wonder Woman. <laughs> Woman! Shield with blocking ability, sword, monsters. <laughs> You're basically just <laughs> going, what are we doing here? But it's one of those things that, that honestly, when I saw it, I went, that might be the most perfect match for a superhero game ever. But it's just one of those you kind of got to wait until it comes out. I got I hope it comes out because Monolith is a really good, good developer. What what's so, what's so is the hold up? Is it is it just? Um... It's troubled, is what the words is. Oh, which just happens with games sometimes because it can become free future creep, or the direction of the game is it going where they want, or just they tried to put a system in place for a while, dumped a bunch of money into it, and didn't work. So then they have to go back to square one to try and get back around that system. Gaming, and especially now, gaming makes money more money than any entertainment media 
ever now. So they're yep. not afraid to dump the money in because there's a good chance that if you strike it good, you're going to easily make it all back. Like, I don't need to remind you that um, GTA 5 cost $220 million to make. And for a couple of years straight, they were making $5 million a day off of microtransactions on their online. Jesus. So... That's why GTA 6 is taking so long, because they don't need to. They can push it off yeah. as long as that's, they can. That's one of those things with Rockstar. They have, like, I want to say, like, seven different studios, because, like, all seven of them together made Red Dead Redemption 2. They've made one game other than GTA 5 since the PS3 that came out when I was in high school. That and, and keep this in mind, for GTA 5, they canceled, I want to say, four single-player expansions, all to dedicate it to making online content, and then G and then Red Dead Redemption. Red Dead Redemption 2. How many copies of Red Dead Redemption 2 were sold? At this current moment, has sold 64 million copies. That game doesn't have a PS5 version. Hmm. No single player DLC, nothing. Wrapped like a bad habit, it sold 64 million copies. And the game costed $60 to buy. So 64 million times 60, carry the zero equals a lot. So you just... And then, like, they won't even put the resources into making a newer version of it, because why? They're making millions of dollars a day off of GTA Online. And then once 6 comes out, they're just going to whoop over to there. Because they tried making Red Dead Redemption Online and then gave up on it after like a year. Because they didn't want to put the money into getting all the resources to make Old West stuff. Because you can't have flying cars going over ramps with horses, so it was harder work to make content. I mean, if you believe hard enough, you can. <laughs> Not in their world, apparently. But, uh, yeah, it's just... Ugh. But, alright. And, uh, hey, do you guys remember how much it costed for Super Bowl commercials? Like, uh, I, think, I think for the last one, it was either between, like, 5 to $7 million for, like, a 30-second spot. Okay. Well, I'm not saying this is important at the Super Bowl, but, um, at Summer Games Fest, for one minute, it was 250 k for two minutes, it was 450k. For 2.5 minutes, it was 550k. Wow, those numbers are. It, for it's just the whole thing about Summer Games Fest is just absurd. I'm like, I get it. E3 is officially dead and gone, but I'm like, this is part I... of the reason why, though. Right? No, I understand that's part of the reason why. I just. I, someone I follow who's like a mutual online said this thing didn't need to be four and a half hours because like if you compare oh. it to like a N Nintendo I, Direct I, I, four. I watched the full thing and it was two hours so if they combined it with all the other shows with it it was four <laughs> yeah I, no I think they're combining it with all the other <laughs> okay, shows all right. but, I, but I'm saying combine that with a Nintendo Direct it's usually like the big ones are like 45 minutes to like an hour I just mm -hmm. Part of me just goes, why? Like, yeah, I'm glad Summer Game Fest exists, but acting like it's going to be the new E3, I'm just, I don't it, think... It, it is, that, that is the thing, though, because all they did was cut out the stuff that didn't make it any money and ended up putting them in the situation they're in. All the live people going there and all the stuff they had set up with the demos and all that, it wasn't making them anything back. And then people did it when they started getting towards COVID and all that, they were just doing all the presentations on their own because it was on their own time and didn't have to pay anything. Now, Summer Games Fest is just basically the general audience who doesn't pay attention to hardcore nerds like me that are like, when's the next showcase? When's the next state of play? When's the next Xbox showcase? When's the next Nintendo Direct? It's for the people that don't realize those things freaking exist. Which, it, if you're, like, even in, like, the most casual gamer, like, I kind of feel like you, these exist, but 
really like two hundred thousand dollars for like a thirty second spot for like essentially like a YouTube commercial to me that's absolutely fucking absurd. Mm-hmm. It is, but then that's the thing where I bring back to where gaming makes more money than any other medium now, and it's getting to the point of where that's a drop in the bucket for some of these people. And no, I get it's a drop insane. in the bucket. I just I feel like on principle it's just it's absurd. It is. It's just that that's the only thing leaving this thing run, and I got a feeling that if it doesn't we're only going to be stuck to when they want to show us stuff. And I kind of don't want that as much as summer games fest is not perfect. You're not going to get indie developers doing anything. If it's only left up to the big three doing stuff. So that's one casualty where if we, we stop doing stuff like this, indie developers are fucked. Because that's the one of the one thing that everyone complains about during every one of these presentations that Jeff makes sure is in there. A good 30 minute chunk dedicated to nothing but indie developers. And then they're like, well, this is the chunk I can skip. That's what always happens. Mm-hmm. Because it's common and not in the streams that I host about it. Because <laughs> gamers are, are dumb. I'm like, well, no, no, wait, gamers are dumb. Um, but no, gamers are dumb. Don't retract that statement. No, no, gamers like... are dumb. <laughs> no, but I feel like it just. I it's it's good that Jeff is giving like highlight to indie games. I wish it was more of the thing, but you know that's just kind of me going through like a wish fulfillment tangent. But like everyone say, ooh, triple A gaming so bad, and then you eat up triple A gaming slop. I'm like, well. What, what do you want them to fucking do? Like, it you're buying this shit. In fact, it's the same thing with movies. No, exactly. Like, you guys like slop. And, and then you're going to ask, like, how dare you give me slop? And they keep buying it. There was a time where Assassin's Creed games came out every year. And people bought them until one was finally broken. A lot. Because all of them were broken at some degree. But uh, anyway. All right, so... I uh I needed to change my pants when I saw this announcement. Uh Trigger is fighting to make a Planet of the Apes anime. I didn't know I needed that in my life. But I want it yesterday. Let, yep. let them do it. I mean, Trigger has worked with Disney before. Um they actually did uh the little animated bit for uh, the toy, the time for God. They did the uh, battle dinos or whatever opening, which is they've like pure done, they, They've also done visions. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, honestly, they're probably the one of the few studios that I would trust with an IP that big. And the fact where the Apes films are now, there's like such a gap of time that you could just do it. I, I'm also loving that we're getting to the point with I love triggers original content but i kind of like the era that they're in for a little bit where they're like what's some shit that other people have that i can make an anime of because like meshy awesome cyber runners or edge runner fantastic yep like i understand they can come up with absolutely bad shit concepts but every now and then, if we're going to sprinkle in a, just a little bit of, what are the Planet of the Apes in there? No, and I, I think that's good, Absolutely. too. I mean, it kind of sucks that the last truly original anime that they did uh, that wasn't based off of a pre-existing IP, which is BNA, which I have issues with. I don't hate it. It's just... Don't like Curry do you? It, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's like a... Six or seven out of ten. Like, it has, like, a lot of story problems. Like, that shit needed to be, like, Kill the Kill or Little Witch Academia. Like, like that needed to be 24 episodes. It was just too ambitious for its own good. So if they want to just try it with, like, other IP, I don't mind that. I would like them to do another original show. Because I think their next thing after Meishi is Panty and Stocking Season 2. Because I don't think they've announced anything else beyond that. They haven't, but that was them bringing back an original thing to continue its that I'm happy with. Yeah, which, which, which is fine. And you know what? For most of their existence, they did completely original IPs. The fact that they're taking a break and, you know, trying some new creative 
directions. I, I'm perfectly fine with that. Is this true? I don't watch has been. Uh, it, it, it does. Yeah, it, yes. Okay. I, it, it's been a while since I've seen BNA, so I, I can't say exactly. If now I think about same. it, they have a lot of similar story structures and issues. Like, now that I think about it, I'm like, this is, that's actually a really good comparison. There you go. I don't watch it, but I will be going to a con in November where I shit you not, 90% of the cast is going to it. That, that, that's All except awesome. for the one I want to meet, Keith David. Of course. <laughs> like... I'm going to two separate cons at the end of the year. And then I went to my friends. I'm like, you guys want to go to Twin Cities Con? And they're like, well, we're kind of strapped for cash and this and that. And the other thing, I'm like, all right, whatever. He's like, well, I might go just to cosplay because I'm going to have like three cosplay stuff by the time that comes out. So like, I might just pay for the ticket and do whatever and just BS around because I actually know one or two cosplayers now. So I'll just meet up with them there and whatever. And then all of a sudden my phone explodes asking me to go book the hotel. I'm like, not y'all were broke. And then I messaged Chris. I'm like, why are we, why do you guys almost want to go to this con now? He goes, look at the page. And six voice actors from Has Been Hotel got announced. And his wife, who is the other part of our trio, is the biggest Has Been nut I've met in my life. I'm like, oh. Yep. See? Got it. <laughs> so I changed it. Speaking of Keith David, uh, Brock, did you see that picture of him on uh, Tiana's Bayou Adventure? And he's like so stoic in the log flume. <laughs> Henry Henry Selick Coraline? Oh, I Do you guys know what he's Oh, oh he's, uh, he's, the Coraline's uh, getting a re-release Oh, got it Oh, nice And then yep. I think he's developing another project with Gaiman which, good Henry Selick The direct the actual director of the Nightmare Before Christmas deserves all his flowers, and like that guy has just gotten like shit deal after shit okay. deal. Like <laughs> I just thought there was something else happening with it. I was like that, that. That is also one thing that is considered a. Oh, now I'm not. Uh oh my gosh, a Tim Burton movie. I don't just. I I get it. I get it. That's the big name, but I hate it. Hate it. Hate it. Like I till now couldn't have told you what the guy's director's name is. Couldn't have told you. And then you read to remind of it there. I just... Uh, and also, uh, the writer of The Nightmare Before Christmas is a woman. Which you probably wouldn't know either. Like, all the stuff that you like about it, Sally and everything else, that exists because of her. All Tim Burton wrote was the original poem and basically Jack and Zero. And I love you know, Tim Burton with all my heart. But cold. saying that he made The Nightmare Before Christmas is not fucking true beyond the initials concept. No. Also, also, look up Danny Elfman now. The, the, the dude looks like a bodybuilder and is not what I expected when I listened to Jack Skellington sing. He's he's al he's almost like 70 years old and looks... He and looks like he's younger than me. And, and Chris Sarandon, I don't think he's aging either. He's adorable. Like, he has his like, own little, like, foodie podcast and he's like, oh, look at these purple potatoes I grew. He's drinking <laughs> that same magical goat milk that Paul Rudd is drinking. So, what... Okay... I need to understand what the statement "almost a sequel" is. I I, th I think I think he's just talking about an, like another project that he's working on with Neil Gaiman. That's I, I'm I'm assuming is just like e either just a spiritual successor or takes place in the same world but not necessarily the same characters. Got it. Okay. This is what whenever I hear that it's it's kind of like a sequel. I'm like, I don't like. What those does words. that mean? I don't like those words. <laughs> what does it mean? All right. Speaking okay. of what does it mean? What does that mean? So yeah. Anyway, he described it. It as that a work of a companion piece. All right. Speaking of what does that mean? Tom Hardy was in an interview. I hate Sony. I love PlayStation. I hate Sony. <laughs> I want to draw a hard line right there. Tom Hardy says in an interview, Sony Universe will have their own Spider-Man. Marvel Universe under Kevin Feige's management is doing so well. Spider-Man has gone to Kevin Feige's camp at Marvel. We have one at Sony. What does that mean? In one movie, Madam Web, he's not even born yet. 
And then in this one, supposedly he's a 10 year old. How do we have Clintars in Finn Earth and Pink If that's true. Somebody does not know what they're doing. a thousand times worse than what they pulled with Gotham. Gotham was at least funny. And it, Jim Gordon. Oh, Gotham. Uh, that show was fucking nuts. <laughs> I, I only ever saw half of the first season. It, uh, it same with me, too. For, like, it was good for, like... Here's, here's the problem with Gotham. Small tangent. The casting was phenomenal. And it would go from literal street drama like Nolan at like not Nolan like I would no, I Nolan uh, at Walmart <laughs> like they were going for a serious tone they would do serious investigations with Batman as characters like the doll maker was in it other stuff like that penguin that were like very street level like normal and then randomly they would just throw Batman and Robin esque episodes in it like a man like just like carrying around a refrigerator and then crushed because he had a bad venom sample and it would look cartoony as fuck and then like their commissioner oh, would turn <laughs> into an executioner wearing an old mask because he got drugged and like held the whole just oh and the, the joker most, not uneven, joker bullshit oh my god it was the most uneven show i'd seen in so long when it hit Holy balls did that show hit, but then it just didn't sometimes. And it didn't hard. <laughs> and it has to date the worst Batman suit I've ever seen. That that's not a Batman suit. That's a that's a that's a um That is Party City. Yeah. Oh, it was bad. Like, I legitimately wanted them. This is my pipe dream. Sony almost had has Sony already has I don't say that. Don't don't like live action i don't want miles anywhere near them i just don't if miles ends up being theirs i'm gonna punch a hole through a tv peter might not be in venom 3 the story leaks for it were completely wrong um no they, they actually aren't in the sony leaks it was a clintar invasion and ralph fines is going to be in it and they were going to have uh whoever played mordo in it those were literally in the leaks and now they're showing a 10 year old child with his aunt 90% of what were in those leaks has happened. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, but those leaks have been pretty motherfucking accurate so far. As, as painful as they are, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to say, but they don't go out of their way to show a 10-year-old and his aunt in a 10-second clip of that trailer for no reason. Un unless, they, unless they pulled a Madam Web and just like completely scrubbed all continuity. I don't know. I don't know. Because what do words they mean? Don't know. <laughs> and also, do we remember? Oh boy, this is going to be for the people that watched it. Do we remember the end of Morbius where Vulture got shoved into. Oh. This I didn't corner wa watch it, of and, it. And I know about that. Oh, Jesus Just Christ. Wait. And then we had an after credit scene where very clearly those two were not in the same room. And he said, hey, I got sent here and I'm pretty sure it has something to do with Spider-Man. You and me should be a thing together. I think we should do some real damage. Spider-Man doesn't fucking exist in their planet yet. But yet there's a, dra a graffiti drawing of Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man on a wall in the movie. No, in the trailer. It never made it to the movie. I swore it was still in there. I I don't I don't remember it in the movie. I only you know what the that, that whole reminds me of? Remember when The Amazing Spider-Man 2 came out uh, and they had like this weird um, like crossover with like the Fox, like, X-Men. Yep, I remember that. It's like the same level of cringe. Like, it didn't work back then. It doesn't work now. <laughs> and the worst part is, all of this could be so simple. It's what they want to do could work. But they're in such a hurry 
and they're picking characters that don't work for solo movies. You could make a crime thriller with Black Cat and have it be her stealing shit from Fisk. You could make a Prowler movie about him taking down some thugs or the people that if you follow the one storyline where he got trapped in the suit going on and then say something where he was looking over Miles and then show Miles at the end of the movie. If you actually picked characters that would work, it's fine. You start to get all these things where Madam Web, Madam Web could be a very cool character to have in these. Madam Web could have very easily have been the Nick Fury of these Spider-Man movies. Yep. And you know what should have happened? Oh, now her name is escaping me. Halloween. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis. You should have had her as Madam Web. Oh. Ooh, that would have that, been cool. That would have been so good. Or better yet, Madam Web should have been like an eight episode like TV series. Or, or she sh- just, it didn't have to even be anything. She Again, she could have just showed up or did whatever. But it's like, and then she could have tied stuff together. Found some kids like this. Again, there is a plot for a seven movie stuck in that one garbage. If there was just like two days of rewrites on that thing, you could have made that a somewhat acceptable movie. It sickens me that when I watched it, I went, if you got rid of that horse shit, that horse shit, tied it in here, it could have been okay. Never could have been great. But it could have been okay. And I just... Uh, people say that the DCEU rushed. I'm sorry. Waiting to give Wonder Woman her own movie and just throwing her into the BBS thing compared to this ain't rushing. No. At all. Because Wonder Woman can just be a character that's there. Wonder Woman didn't need an introduction. She's fucking what? Yeah. My mom knows who Wonder Woman is. Like, she could she could have easily just popped up in, in BBS and, like, she's just Wonder Woman. Yes. All right. I'm going to say the things that I'm going to say carefully so that I don't get misconstrued. People that describe things need to learn how to shut up. <laughs> because they just give ammo to everyone that wants to call everything woke garbage. Because sometimes when they say statements like this, they're making it sound like they're trying to create woke garbage. Act like creator. How do you pronounce her first name? Um, Les- Leslie. Le- uh, no, Le- Leslie. Leslie. Leslie Headland says that in a good way. That acolyte is the gayest Star Wars ever, and that she knows for a fact that R two D two is a lesbian. Okay. Why do we need to say these things? Hold on, I can I I can defend this, or at least the latter do, part. Uh, do, I watched the interview. It's not taken out of context. <laughs> no, but she's she's also just like she's just kind of saying it in jest. The the part about R two D two. But don't say it. No, that's I, I, what I'm I, getting at. I know because people are dumb and take everything in bad faith. So even if I was saying, hey. RR2D2's gay, ha 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 ha. This podcast has a woman that's woke. <laughs> <laughs> but look, just it's why do we even need to bring these up in interviews? Why do here's the thing I am a straight male Christian. My favorite anime of all time is Gurren Lagat. One of my favorite characters in it is a trans male. <laughs> I'm okay if these characters exist. I write a fan fiction where, for Ruby where the main character is a lesbian who is an adopted daughter of two lesbians. <laughs> I don't care what you are. A ki- where it needs to, the line needs to be drawn in why the problem where a lot of this lies is when a show gets introduced now it gets introduced with this character's gay like them where it should be 
this character has a connection with this person and this person and this person, and you watch the show and you notice that they're gay. And but, they're awesome. But it's Pride Month. We have to pander so people will buy our rainbow-themed merch. <laughs> but here's the thing. You can then ruin a great character by making the most important thing about them their sexual orientation. Well, I mean, that's the, the whole thing. I'm like, look, I, I'm going to be, like, open about it. I'm, I'm, I'm openly bisexual. Like, that shouldn't be, a, like, a fucking secret to anyone. But the thing that always kind of grinds my ass is like, yeah, it's part of my identity, but it's not like the singular thing about me. And no. especially with Disney and the most egregious thing, oh, we have like the first gay character, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, it shouldn't matter that they're gay. <laughs> like, that's the whole point. You're pandering and you're baiting people, which which is bad. And then you have the reactionary types of like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm gay people. <laughs> that makes my male jingle jangles very angry. It's, it's it's a never ending ending loop. There's no you, it's like just... you, you get you get the same thing like every single time for what the past ten years now. No, it's like here's the keys. Here's here, here's the keys. Look at the rainbow keys. Doesn't that make you feel something? Doesn't and... that make you feel accepting? Or does it make you very very angry? And it's one of those things where here's the thing. I have a at work, everything in the city. My literal best friend is one of the most open lesbians I've met in my entire life. Ever. I'm telling you right now, she's one of the most prideful lesbians I've ever met in my entire life. And she doesn't do it as her entire personality. I will tell you right now that if you sold something to her on the fact that it had a lesbian in it, she's like, cool, is it good? And, and that's the problem with a lot of, like, these big mainstream things. They're just, they're not good. Because it can't be too gay because then hey, that's Jacob. not marketable. <clears throat> well, and that and that and that's where it is. Like, this is the reason why the South Park episode exists. Make it gay and put a woman in it and make her lame. That exists because that's what they just do sometimes. South Park, as it is extreme... Does it based off of real stupid shit that's happening? Everyone is allowed to be their own thing. Everyone can be whatever you want. But like you said, Brie, I'm not watching someone's sexual orientation. I'm going to make... <laughs> I don't know if I brought this up before, but this is the perfect definition of this. I don't... Have I brought up the, the Ron White thing here before? I'm... It's it's been a been a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, my favorite thing when it comes to all of this, I like to tell people, "Hey, I'm straight, but Ryan Reynolds exists." That's that's the, just the thing where I'll openly admit, "Holy hell, is he a handsome individual?" Here's the thing: everybody's a little bit the other way, whether they like to admit it or not. And here's how I can tell you: one of my favorite jokes of Ron White ever, ever. And then I'll lead into one that's by Pete Holmes. <laughs> So, the dumbest thing in the world, and I agree about this, that you can be, is homophobic. Being afraid of gay people is one of the dumbest things you'd ever be. Do I want to be hit on by a gay person? No. Am I afraid that I'm in a room with them that my head's going to explode? No. When I was in New Orleans recently, me and every member of my family that was straight accidentally walked into a gay bar, and everyone there was the nicest people we had ever met. It was right off of Bourbon Street, and we wanted somewhere quiet. We joked about it, had a good time, and walked back out, and everyone in there was magical. We got handed free condoms and all sorts of other <laughs> shit. It was a fun time. Ron White goes, and he has his cousin that is extremely homophobic. And he's like, everyone's a little bit gay, and I can prove it. And he goes, I'm not gay at all. I'm like, I can prove it. He's like, fine, prove it. Okay, do you watch porn? He goes, yeah, I watch porn. I love porn. You know that. Cool. Will he only watch two women having sex? He's like, no, I'll watch a woman and a man making love. He's like, cool. Do you like the man to have a half flaccid penis? He's like, no, I love big throbbing cu <laughs> I did not know that about myself. <laughs> and the other one, which is a recent one for Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes, in my opinion, is one of the most genuinely 
hilarious people I've ever seen in any form of media. Where any person that watches porn is the gayest person on the planet. <laughs> Especially if it's a man. Any man who watches porn is gay. And because masturbation for a man is possibly the gayest thing humanly possible. Because A, you're giving a hand job to a man, and B, you're receiving a hand job from a man. And you're getting off to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everyone. If we're going to do these things, we need to realize little stuff about ourselves that we may not want to talk about. <laughs> but just, we need to not say things in stupid ways. And a lot of Even it... Even jokingly, we need to address it. I just, the thing is, and this is, I feel like, a lot of, you know, interviews now and, like, how they're set up are, like, so clickbaity. Because this is why, you know, we get the same 7,000 fucking questions about, but what does Martin Scorsese think about the MCU? What the fuck does that or have to do with fucking anything? Journalism is dead. It's, well, it is. If Half of it isn't stupid questions or, like, just AI-generated garbage. But the, the point is, is that... When you're write, writing a character, like, yes, that's an aspect of their pers personality, but people often at, like, corporate rev levels just think, that's it. They're here, you know, we just check off this little magic box, you know, look at how progressive we are while we still donate thousands of dollars to homophobic individuals that put LGBTQ people in danger. <laughs> Like my favorite thing, and I know it doesn't exactly apply the same way. There was an interview I want I want to say it was with Denzel. It was either Denzel Washington or Morgan Freeman, where he says if he could do anything, or one thing he wishes is that they would get rid of Black History Month. Why do we need to have everything important about us delegated to a month? Why does it need to be? Because he's like we're then now making ourselves be the exception that we need a month in order for ourselves to consider ourselves important. And and then white people get bent out of shape saying that we need to have white hetero pride existence forever. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's the same thing every, every time. The only, the only one where I've seen someone get like upset about pride month where I thought it was genuine. And I will be openly honest about this. It was Morgan Freeman. Thank you. It's got plopped directly onto male mental health. And I'm going to be honest with you, that is an actual, genuine, honest-to-God problem. Mm -hmm. That never gets talked about. Ever. And that's coming from a person who had a suicide attempt. It's a thing that no one's... It, that is just, uh, you need to be a tough guy and deal with it. And if you try to say you're having a hard time, it's just, oh well. You're... You, you you know you're gay or you're too sensitive but like it's honestly kind of like in the venn diagram like a lot of these circles are connected mm -hmm. uh, all right anyway moving on from that the thing that i said should have been done a long time ago because they honestly can't make a good sequel to save their asses leslie also wants to make a knights of the old republic project why hasn't this been done yet B because it has executives stuff are cowards. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say cowards. I would say idiots because they're not cowards. They're more than happy to make all sorts of new stuff. But yet we won't make a movie based on something you don't have to be creative for. It's all right there. And there's a shit ton of it. <laughs> yeah, Disney's been kind of weird about... About... Um what stories they tell with Star Wars because yeah there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that's set pretty close to the Skywalker saga and the acolyte is one of the few projects that's taking place in the High Republic which is set a hundred years before the Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. Which someone brought up to me today that there's an honest to God lore issue in that show. Um oh I I think I know what they're referring to. That in the Phantom Menace, they say they, I believe they haven't seen a Sith in over a thousand years. 
there's a Sith in the Acolyte, and it's a hundred years before the Phantom Menace. <laughs> and I it's it. several I Jedi it's... have seen it, so everyone in that show has to die, or they just don't care about that well, continuity. I think it's... I'm not sure. The Acolyte might be 400 years before, but that's still there. But I think it's the same, you, you know, kind of Star the Wars. Person here. I think it's the same logic of, you know, how everyone, you know, forgets the Jedi exists like 20 years after Revenge of the Sith. I think it's just one of those things you're just going to have to, like, just turn your brain off for a second. Yeah. <laughs> they said in a millennium, I'm sorry, even more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was very wrong in the opposite way. I was giving him credit. Well, like, did I ever tell you... Oh, it was 100 years, but did I ever... Never tell you guys the exact movie that I want. Never... Oh, never mind, I'm dumb. Wait, what? We, we, we got our timelines confused. <laughs> anyway, but, uh... You want to know the movie that I want, and they're never going to make it? Hmm. I want, and, and this sounds like dumb. But I want an Order 66 snub film. <laughs> you know what? I get it. it, it it'll, mm. it'll never happen, but... Can you imagine how ridiculous that would be? Like an actual in-depth of them hunting down... Story, like hunting down Jedi? And not just a 10-second clip in Revenge of the Sith? I mean... At the bare minimum, at least in the final episodes of Clone Wars, they kind of sort of touch on that. But I'm like, but the thing about that is they would actually have to confront genocide and that's not very family friendly. So we can't Are you do trying that. to tell me that they don't <laughs> want to show a very Nazi-ish style regime committing genocide? I don't know. It's just kind of a hunch, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's accurate. All right, so The Last of Us, apparently the next season, which everyone seems to be confused with the fact that they said openly that the second game's going to be multiple seasons. They said that off the rip right away. How, how long season, is the game? Like how many hours? How, um, Depending on how you play, I got 30 hours out of it. <laughs> okay, so they can they can bring out that story and get or... and keep in mind that there is a week long of each character at one point events leading up stuff in between flashbacks all that there we go nice jacob but uh what i think is going to happen and why uh <laughs> uh god oh, no, pedro pascal said he had a light shooting schedule <laughs> season i think they're actually going to make the first season leading up to when everyone spoiler alert for the last of us two what happens in the first hour and a half of the game they're going to have season one end when joel dies i mean I on a narrative level i think that makes sense and then have the whole um abby versus ellie thing kind of be like a season three thing like yeah. i i get that i can see it i could see them honestly making it where that season for season two is leading up to that season three ish and they said it's a possible season three will be significantly longer with season four as a possibility so i think they're going to make season three a better version of the two weeks that each character got because they each have five days mike and they enter they have you play the five days of ellie so that you have moments with her and all their stuff and then you have five days of abby where they're actually written really well where you're like then meeting in the moments where you're realizing they just miss each other and a bunch of stuff so i think they might intertwine the days and make it flow a little better and then the aftermath of them in Seattle will be season four. Hmm. That's what I honestly think is going to happen. Sounds like a good plan. It would make sense. If you play, if you played the game, it kind of brackets itself in that kind of way. And I think they'll honestly do it this way to give Pedro Pascal more time on screen. Because if you don't do it this way, he's going to be there for, half of the first episode 
<laughs> Makes sense. So, yeah, it, I just they've done a really good job so far. They made the the uh, zombies a lot scarier in a way with the tendrils and shit. So, oh, it's, so, it's such good creature design. Oh, absolutely. And they made a whole, again, Mike, they made a whole episode about Bill. When you just encounter him, he runs you through some traps. And you found out through a note that he had a partner. And you find him hanging himself at the end. There was no extended our entire lives together thing with Bill in the game. And, and, and that and was like that one of the most powerful like the episodes of television. Pro probably yep. the best episode in the entire show so far. And now I can't listen, and now I can't listen to Linda Ronstead without without bawling my eyes. Exactly. And like and to show this exact thing about how people don't care if characters are gay as long as they're written well. The people that I turned my last my last name to was my youth pastor in high school. He came over as my surrogate father because my dad was an absolute piece of garbage. He's one of the most devout Christians I've ever met in my entire life. We watched season one with him. You want to know what he said at the end of that episode? Wow. That was incredibly well written. He didn't care! Because it was just good! They made the selling point that they loved each other. Yeah, that's all. That's all. But you that mean. that would be admitting that they're human and not commodified products, which is like a whole like bigger issue. And it's just it, entertainment frustrates me. <laughs> you don't say. Capitalism. Capitalism at its finest. Like, and basement-dwelling dumbasses that I went into last time. But, all right. Now, one thing one thing that's really happy that I'm happy they're going to do, but I'm not sure how they're going to do, because if they do this... Oh, I gotta remember her name. Julia Maggio, who is Julia Stunts on Instagram. I thought of her instantly. Just an overall amazing woman. The Academy is exploring the possibility of adding a stunt category to the Oscars. It's about damn time. Seriously. Yes. And we're take we're talking to members of the stunt community and all that. It's just that they're obviously probably going to do it as stunt choreography of said film. Because I'm not sure how it works. Like the girl who I'm talking about is an Emmy nominated stunt woman. And like how they're gonna do it, cause like it's not gonna be obviously like this one guy in this one film did this one thing better than anyone. Okay, so how so how they do it for the Screen Actors Guild is they have they they have a category outstanding performance by a stunt ensemble. Okay. So that's that's probably how I, I think that'd be the most fair. Yeah, I think if because aren't they doing the best casting thing as yep. well? So I mean it's kinda like similar rules of play when you think about it. Yeah. I think for that one, they're um, like the award is going to casting director. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, you can see it. That could be good. Okay. I'm I'm just happy that they're acknowledging because those people do a lot. Like a person lost their arm for a Paul W. Anderson Resident Evil movie. So. If these people credit. Mm -hmm. Seriously. <laughs> that, uh, all right. like, voice acting and, like, motion capture acting, I just... They gotta get with, get with the times. Yes. Because voice acting is real acting. Yes, it's one of the main things I want to punch John Campy in the face when he talks about. Voice acting is acting. You literally can only use your voice. You don't get to use extra mannerism. Right. But, and, all right. And, like, because Herb does it doesn't work without voice acting i'm like or, and same with like the circus um planet of the apes films like they they don't mm -hmm. work without like voice or uh facial motion capture no they don't they do not whatsoever and people don't get that but you're just not gonna win some people over but 
All right, Mike. So you put this next one in here. I want you to talk about it and tell me how the hell I didn't hear of K-pop demon hunters until now. Wait, you didn't hear about it until now? Holy shit. No! Okay. Time to to talk about this whole this whole Netflix preview and specifically K-pop Demon Hunters. If I that can. and freaking um, what was it, Leviathan? Uh, yeah, Leviathan. Uh, Bree, start talking while I try to find um, a comprehensive article Here. that lists all of these. Here. Oh, God, um, in the chat. So, K-pop Demon Hunters is a Sony um, animation, a pictures film. I think at one point it was supposed to go theatrical, and then as part of uh, Sony's ongoing deal with Netflix, it eventually moved over to streaming. And not a lot's been known about it. Like, this is kind of like the first real comprehensive footage that we've gotten about it. It's been kind of shrouded in mystery for the last couple years. Mm Mm-hmm. And what some of these, as we look at them, I need to start kind of, you know, picking the bones of what's considered an anime. Great quest, great, great point because, um, because that what, King Kong show that came out, Skull uh, Island, Skull was considered an, that was considered uh, an anime. But if I showed that to anyone, they wouldn't think that was an anime. Well, because it, it was made in Texas. I get that, but it was advertised as an anime. Well, anime technically just means a- animation. And honestly, that's kind of vague. Because I, I, it's not I, really a consistent thing. Because, like, Avatar The Last Airbender, yes, it's technically, technically Western animation. But most people, if you look at it, I'm like, that's fucking anime. That's what I'm getting at when I say advertised as an anime. This whole horseshit that people don't like, that whatever, it needs to be made in Japan to be an anime... There's well-known animes that were made in Italy that people consider animes, but yet they'll bitch about other ones like Ruby that are anime inspired by no, because it's made in Texas. It's not an anime. Anime now to me is a set of tropes and very Japanese things that are put into an animation because guess what? If we're going by that rule that it's just what you call anime or animation in Japan, SpongeBob's a fucking anime. Yep. But yet, Everyone will say, well, that's what just, that's what Japanese people call animation. Cool. I have people that live in my town that grew up in Japan. They don't call Paw Patrol an anime. They call it an animated TV show. There is differences in these classifications. Because, like, we have Tomb Raider on here. That doesn't look like one. But yet the Castlevania anime and the Terminator one look like animes yep well i don't get the advertisement because you're gonna get people looking for an anime that want it and won't get it and then you'll have people that weren't looking for an anime and were looking for an animated show that weren't looking for it because it wasn't advertised as an animated show and here and here's since since you brought up the tomb raider um i have to bring up another show that powerhouse did called blood of zeus the first, the first season, they described it as a Netflix anime series, and then in season two, they they dropped the they dropped the anime and they and they just call it a Netflix series. <laughs> which t- to me proves that it's all just like Netflix marketing bullshit. Which honestly, that kind of tracks. Yeah. yeah. Now speaking of Netflix marketing bullshit, the fact that they that they did do this entire slate of. <laughs> The, like the fact that they did this entire um, preview of their 2024 and 2025 slate is actually pretty cool because we have yeah. because they have like really cool stuff. Like one thing that I'm really looking forward to is Twilight of the Gods, which is uh, Zack Snyder's Norse mythology series mm-hmm. that comes out in September. And but will it have his biggest boobs of Record of Ragnarok? <laughs> I know uh, nothing else about that show. <laughs> nothing else except that image. <laughs> now the the one the one that everyone is raving about for good reasons is K pop demon hunters. Yes. That looks amazing. 
Tokyo Override looks pretty good, too. Yeah, a, a, a lot of these look great. Yeah, and I was just like, I'm sitting here, and I'm like, okay, Arcane's ending. Man, it'd be really cool if for some stupid reason they actually made it an animated movie about KDA and, like, an actual, like, them becoming pop stars thing because like in some versions of their continuity they actually are just pop stars and then k-pop starts up i'm like are they making a fucking okay no they aren't <laughs> but yeah I, I didn't realize netflix had that much shit going on yeah they they have a lot of things that are uh well, yeah, they have a lot of things that they don't bother to market until, like, a week before the show comes out. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And just to prove that point even further, Brock, did you know that this weekend um, there's a movie, an animated movie, based on uh, Ultraman called Ultraman Rising? Not until I saw this. Exactly. I love Ultraman, and I wish I would have known about that sooner, because I'd have been raving about it and sharing it. Yeah, they literally dropped, like, one teaser trailer maybe, like, a month and a half, like, two months ago. That make no sense to me. It, it, oh, and by the way, it's co-directed by one of the, the uh, directors of Kubo and the Two Strings. Yep. Tra Travis Knight or the other? Uh, no, or... um, Shannon Tindall. Okay, got it. Who's a great follow on Twitter. Yeah, oh, and Guillermo del Toro's involved and no one's like fucking talking about it like at all that like unless you're like thing. yeah unless you're like into like animation like me and my car and like keeping up with the shit like you would not know that this movie is coming out the same day as inside out too they only <laughs> care about Guillermo del Toro when he's making people fuck fit <laughs> <laughs> like here's the thing why can't we give Guillermo del Toro a budget and have him make his other Pacific Rim movies he wanted to make in animation. Or, like, make the third Hellboy animated. There you go. It's the only way we get it! I, actually, a, um, a Hellboy movie in style. Hey, in man, this is my podcast. I'm reading shit. <laughs> <laughs> I may be white. I'm here to listen. That's part of why I'm here. <laughs> A, a Hellboy anime, animated film in stop motion would be, uh, be amazing. Because I know we got, like, what was it, like, the two, like, direct-to-video uh, Hellboy yeah, movies. Yeah, they were and, actually like, pretty good. Yeah, I saw them. I remember them being good. And that's another thing where, like, it looks fine in live action, but the art style that the comic's drawn in lends itself more to being freakish looking exactly yeah i just executives need to not be afraid of cartoons because at least american executives it's cartoons like such a stupid children. thing I, uh, meanwhile the, the french make like insane shit like this, this is like such a specifically american problem yeah it mean meanwhile in france like all like three three movies in my top 10 of this year are all animated films from France. Mm -hmm. We have Chicken for Linda, uh, Sirocco, um, Kingdom of the Wind, and Mars Express, which is one of the coolest sci-fi things I've seen probably ever. Well, also the French actually fund their animation and give proper film credits, which is uh, one of the reason why um, Illumination can do the stuff that they do because a, a lot of people forget that Illumination's a French animation company. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they like to not think about it, but it is. And one one more thing before we move on, I love I love the title of the sequel for um, Wallace, Wallace and, Gromit. and Gromit. I know I'm so excited. I can't believe he, he's back. I'm like, this has been like literally thirty plus years in the making, and because Wallace and Gromit, I think the last like full short they did was. Uh, in 2008, so it's kind of been like a hot minute since there's been any Wallace and Gromit uh, content other than like some weird like VR stuff that they did like a couple years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm like kind of su super excited about this one. 
Yeah, like I the, like some of the like my Oni girl, that one I knew about somehow. That one I gotten through osmosis. But then you would have told me that like there's another Sailor Moon project going on. I was shocked. I was like, uh, I didn't realize that they were still doing it. I thought the the last one was the last one, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I just don't get why they do things this way. But uh, yeah, yeah. all right, because the algorithm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Speaking of the algorithm and things not working out well, um, I didn't know that this wasn't a thing that didn't happen, but somehow the still rotting corpse of Gainix had survived until 2024 <laughs> and now just officially filed for bankruptcy. Good Nearly fucking Renix. Fucking Renix of fucking Gainax. What a bunch of motherfuckers. I mean, to be fair... The real Gynax still exists. It's just it's Kara and, it, like, Trigger now. It's, yeah. And it's been that way for a while, but what a f- fucking cancerous fucking capitalism, like, nightmare. I- I'm and, glad it's gone. And Studio, Tr- I guess, um, Kara and Anno are helping redistribute all the shit back to its original owners, which is nice. Which yeah, some that- of that had been going on already because Trigger had... Get had um, Gurn Lagan and Panty and Stockings. Yeah, but so, that took like, like a good solid decade to kind of get some of them mm, back. Yeah. But, it, it's just, it's such a revolutionary company. Like, I was just talking with someone the other, um, it was yesterday, about a game, game uh, Stellar Blade that I've been playing on stream. Really good game. The plot is bordering on Evangelion. And well, I shouldn't say minus. I was about to say minus the biblical re- <laughs> biblical references, and oh boy, was that wrong. Um, but it, it's the whole we're fighting our enemies with our enemies. It's that, but like twerked by two percent. And then a friend of mine was like, "Wow, I've never. That was an interesting idea." I'm like, "Man, they've been doing that for thirty years since it was done in Evangelion." Oh my god. And I was like, back then, that plot was revolutionary. Like, they were the ones that was like, we're fighting our own kind. And then they... Anyway, but I'm not going to mention that because we're going to be doing a fresh takes on that series at some point. Oh. Um, so don't mention any more about anything. Uh, oh, this is gaming news. This is actually a, a breaking, kind of, sort of. So, um... I'm not sure if you guys play, like, Persona or, like, have a breaking detail, but uh, the leaker known as uh, Midori, who supposedly um, is, like, a Japanese woman, is, in fact, a white dude. Huh. (laughs) Wait, wait. Say that again. I partially spaced out with that. What what was that? So, um, a well-known Japanese uh, leaker who conveniently is able to speak... um, English called Midori, who does a lot of like leaks with like. Persona. Oh, so they've been posing as a woman. Uh huh. They just got outed as a man now. Uh-huh. Okay, got and this it. is happening right now. <laughs> wow. So, did they have like? Did say get doxxed? Did they have like a persona so, on screen and equipment broke? <laughs> so, uh, from what I understand from my friends, uh, basically a teenage fan got like rebuffed by them and ended up revealing a lot more y- info and say, "Oh, by the way, uh, they've been lying to y'all. Like they ain't in Japan and they ain't a lady. They're like a white dude." <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds but, about internet. Anyway, that I didn't I didn't even know that person existed, but I'm I'm happy that the stuff's gonna go where it's gonna go and it's not just sitting in some rights basement like a lot of stuff at um uh shoot Madhouse is. Oh no. Like a lot of like freaking uh Claymore and Soul Eater and all the rights to do animation for that shit is just sitting in a basement and then then that guy left to make freaking Mappa, and then after he left Mappa, it turned into Boof. But yeah, I'm happy this stuff's gonna go back to where it's gonna go. Like Gunbuster, 
was like the original inspiration, if I'm pretty sure, about why the freaking spikes are on um, Satsuki Kiryuing's freaking Kamui uniform. Because it looks identical to the mech and Gunbuster. But, uh, yeah, it, it'd be cool if they did some more stuff like that. Like, I know that they've, there's been some other FLCL projects and other things, but I oh, just, Anno, oh, Anno, I love you. And I know you have your stuff back. We covered everything that I wanted to cover for Evangelion. Sir, you said in the past that you could see yourself revisiting these characters again. Don't. Seriously. No, it's... Enough. It's, it's, Couldn't it's, have uh... ended it any better than you did in the rebuild films. Don't. As yeah, I, it is, don't. No. I love you. you, you I'm so happy you got to go back and do what you do and possibly... One of, if not the best combinations of 3D and 2D animation in a thing ever? In those rebuild films with the angels being 3D? Mm-hmm. It was really good. Oh. But, uh, all right. So, oh, Mike. Brock, it, it, hold on, it gets better. Oh, dear <laughs> God. What is... Oh, here we go. But it, why, it's not opening. Why is it... Yeah, uh, every day the internet gets a little stranger. Oh my, I love Ozzy. This thread goes on for a while here. Oh, Mystic so Dude. Okay. That that's that's going on for a while. We're not getting into any of that because that shit gets dicey the further that goes down. <laughs> so all right, yeah, I guess they're a sock of mystic distance. Jesus Christ, <laughs> Mike, you put oh. the sky dance thing into here, so go ahead. Okay, so oh yeah, <laughs> another um, laugher this week. Yes. So to make a long story short, Paramount and Skydance and. At some point, Sony were all in this dance of of who who is going to who is going to merge with Paramount. There was at one point a deal for like twenty six billion dollars that so that Sony offered. Paramount's like, nah, we're good. And then, up until I read this article, I was ninety nine percent positive that Skydance was going to close the deal with Paramount. Which, it made, it made sense because they had a prior history with, with Paramount, specifically mm -hmm. like the Transformers movies. Like, they had a good working relationship and that's the one that Sherry Redstone really, really wanted. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then I hear, I hear this where Redstone's like, no, we're not doing that. Uh, a spokesperson for the Redstone-run National Amusements, which controls Paramount, stated that the company announced that they have not been able to reach mutually acceptable terms regarding the potential transaction with Skydance Media for the acquisition of controlling stake in National Amusements. So, yeah, where... That's the question. Where, where do they go from here? They want to merge I, with somebody so bad it's going to end up being a person they don't want. Or I should say, people don't want. I just, the whole saga with... Weren't the they looking to merge with Peacock too at one point? Or was that someone else? I, that, I, I heard some, something like that. Okay. I Bree, you were saying something? Uh, just the whole saga of... Well, well, I mean, really the whole saga of, like, this Paramount, like, where it is now, kind of, you got to go back to when um, Viacom split apart in, like, 2005. And yeah, 2005, kinda... 2006. Yeah. And that was, like, a whole big, big thing. And then Sherry, like, re-merging them, which, again, was kind of a fucking terrible idea. Like, it made sense like, on some level, because that's what Disney was doing, but, like, this whole thing, and then, you know, her, like, the whole drama of, like, the family and getting, you know, the reins of the company, like, this whole thing has just been, like, a hot mess. Yeah, corporate mergers technically are. Mm-hmm. 
No, it's just, it's extra special. It just, it seems, like, so, like, di directionless. Which is a shame. And then Skydance, which buried in that art article that was, like, it's either during that or it was the article that came out, like, a couple days earlier um, with Skydance Animation and, like, Oh, last God, year. That's, a, that, that's a whole other headache. Like, just bad times for all. But, like, I feel like it's partially connected to this. Like, it's, it's too convenient that these two stories drop around the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Skydance is in a weird place right now. And what's, e what's even weirder is Skydance Animation had a deal with Apple TV, but after one... <laughs> After one project kind of flopped both critically and numbers wise, um, that being the movie Luck, which was produced, executive produced by John Lasseter, who is running Skydance Animation after being ousted at Pixar mm -hmm. for all the things that he's done. And here's like the conversation that people don't want to have is that John Lasseter has always been, like, a fucking hack. Like, the only truly, like, good movie he ever directed was Toy Story 2. But, it, like, if you just think about it, every, like, good Golden Age Pixar movie wasn't directed by Lasseter. It's either Andrew Stanton, Brad Bird, or um, the current head of Pixar Pete animation. Doctor. Yeah, Pete Docter. Like, when, when you think about it, and this is absolutely it's true, John Lasseter is like a tech guy who who failed yeah, upwards and the re and this is kind of the reason why Disney's in the way right now it's the constant need to yeah, control and the reason that we kind of started to get good Pixar movies again is because he wasn't there every day like Pixar succeeded in spite of him and no one really wants to have that conversation <laughs> that you know John Lasseter isn't this you know myopic like genius and stuff I'm like Josh Whedon, in actuality, probably contributed more to the Toy Story than fucking John Lasseter, if we're being perfectly honest. <laughs> or, or even, or even Andrew Stanton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of those things that you don't, people don't look into it. They don't see the true shit about that. And it's... We'll, we'll, we'll get back to Pixar in a second. But on the more positive side, we have a first look at Lord of the Rings: The War of the Rohirrim. I have to see if anyone agrees with me, especially based off of this is done by a Japanese studio. Now, this looks great, but I feel that someone was watching One Piece when they designed the faces. Does that not look like a lot like Nico Robin right there? And this also look a lot like the very sharp edgings of most One Piece faces. <laughs> I kind of get that. I think it's done by the same uh, studio that did Black Lotus. Okay. Probably. Let me hang on. Let me it look looks up amazing. The, let me let me just look up the the name of the director because it's, Kate, it's uh shoot, what was his name? Uh, do, 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 uh Kenji Kamiyama. Yep, that's the guy. Oh, that just makes you think of freaking um, <laughs> uh shoot. Uh, Kabardi Har. Kami! Oh! <laughs> it, it, lo it looks great. This looks freaking phenomenal. Yeah. The coloring on that is off the charts. And this, and this is out in theaters in December. And I am very much looking forward to this. See, this is the Lord of the Rings things that I want. Yeah, not, you good. know, the midquel prequel of The Hobbit slash Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I, just, okay. I, I still can't believe that fucking Gollum movie is going to exist. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I hope that thing does well because I want them to do more things with Lord of the Rings. That's like, we're, well, I'm talking about how I would pretty much give up my firstborn for this Planet of the Apes trigger anime. This is why mm -hmm. we get stuff like this. Yeah, and I don't the smogs. I I, okay. I like I like the smog. I wasn't really that. One confused. was okay. Three was eh. Yeah, I will say that probably the second one was the best of all of them. Probably. 
I liked Smog for the whole um, minute and a half that he was in the third one. And all the glorious labor laws that were completely destroyed to make it happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, Umbreen. I would probably say of all those that the second one was the best one. That's kind of a theme with those Lord of the Rings trilogies. I honestly would say that Two Towers is the best of those three. Return of the King. All of them are very good. Yeah. They were severely lacking in the main trilogy, but it was nice. Yeah, it was really nice to take out. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's controversial to say Two Towers is the best one. I mean, I thought that was pretty much like a commonly held belief. And the All reason... I had that was... Like I don't, I don't know how the range of stuff anymore. Cause like the other day I got read the Riot Act that of the original trilogy, my favorite movie was Empire Strikes Back. I'm like, I thought that was a pretty common thought process, but apparently I was very wrong. Huh. Well, I think of the Empire Strikes Back. It, it was originally a super divisive because most people hated that movie when it came out, and now it's like a beloved cult classic. You know, the internet before the internet. Time is a flat circle. Saw one and saw two and three, and is it two and three of the Hobbit or two and three of Lord of the Rings? He, he's talking about the Lord of the Rings because Fat, Fathom Events um, did a, a re release of oh, nice. the original trilogy in 4K, which I'm kind of jealous. That would be great, that would have been awesome. But yeah, no, I'm I'm really excited about that. That looks that looks freaking phenomenal. But, uh, all right, so on to one last dicey, possibly last very dicey. bad situation. <laughs> Mike? Uh, this, this, he this headline is... The, the, the interview itself is, is better than this, but this is a really striking headline where it says, um, according to Pixar's Pete Doctor, if Inside Out 2 doesn't succeed... We have to radically rethink our business. I can kind of tell just by reading this that that this article is kind of a response to the Bloomberg article that came out. Was it last week? Oh yeah, yeah, it was like last week. That like set the entire animation Twitter on fire. Oh, and then also made my Twitter set on fire because I made a, a joke to uh, Dana Terrace and she responded and my phone just basically vibrated nonstop for like two days. <laughs> Holy shit. Yep. And Mike knows the tweet that I'm talking about, which is very funny. And then the follow-up joke about the orcas and leaving people unemployed also kind of banged off too, which I was proud of. <laughs> yeah, so... Long story short, Pixar Pixar's in a weird in a weird place right now. Between between the layoffs and probably one of the dumbest comments in that Bloomberg article about um you know, they're they're kinda of talking about which which of their movies were a success, which weren't over the past couple years. Lightyear, the movie based on Bud's Lightyear that... Universally, critically, and not financially well received at all. <laughs> and yet, it's it's the movies that were released on Disney Plus that were thrown under the bus. Yep. And so there was a big to do about about Pixar abandoning, you know, autobiographical movies and focusing just on, you know, big broad entertainment. And then the and then the quotes that Pete Doctor says in this article aren't really that much better, but they clarify a lot of what of what that article is talking about. Gia, hey Umbrian, is it almost because they don't get a chance to make money like tickets? It's almost like they're set out to die. <laughs> And we devalued our product so people don't run out to the movie theaters anymore because they know it's going to be on streaming in a, f in a few weeks. You know, Especially like when that. Pull the movie off after literally two weeks. What's the point of going to the theater? And it'll be those same people that'll pitch, I really wish I could go to the movies now. No, it was your fault the theaters are gone, jackasses. Mm hmm.
Yeah, here, here's the part in the in the time interview where they kind of reference the. That's you're about to say the time period. <laughs> So a recent Bloomberg article emphasized that going forward, Pixar is going to prioritize universality over specificity, which means fewer movies inspired by a creator's specific childhood experiences and more based on universal truths. But as journalists were taught, the specific is universal, which, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and this is Pete Doctor's response. I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding about that because it's not that those movies were too specific. But what I found is sometimes if you were telling a personal story, you'll be like, oh, no, that's not the way the story goes, because my story is this. But we're not telling my story. We're telling a story that needs to work for a fictional character that we're <laughs> creating. So there's sometimes a reluctance to let go or let the movie shape itself the way it needs to. <clears throat> it's just such a like words out of a statement. And. Uh, honestly, By that logic, Elemental wouldn't have been made. Because <laughs> yeah. here, here's the thing. I'm like, I'm still giving Doctor the benefit of the doubt because this seems like so wildly like yeah, out, out of character or if he's just being like brutally honest. But like, I think it's I'm going to be honest. I mean, but let's it be real. This is pretty much all of JPEG's fault. Oh, it, it absolutely is Chapek's fault. I mean, I agree to some helping. some some degree, but him like putting helping. everything everything of Pixar on streaming has done catastrophic damage to Pixar's brand. And oh, and not and not to um, you know not to compare them to Illumination again, but they've honestly been doing a lot of smart business choices by. A, delaying the the Minion sequel to, I I think like two years after after its original release date when it was postponed because of COVID, and then just the fact that um, they treat their animators well, they're very anti AI, and they've and they've made and they've also made fun of like the corporate structure of Hollywood. Oh, oh yeah, oh, the, the whole thing about the reboots. I'm like, see, this is how you could tell that they're they're French because I'm like, it's like such a French thing to do. But that's why Illumination works is because, you know, and I, I hate to say it, it's just a lot of this bullshit, like the corporate stuff, Comcast get, can't really do with like cutting it workers because they're outside of the United States. Mm-hmm. Like say say what you want about individual movies that Illuminations produced. As a company, I respect them a whole lot more than than most of mainstream Hollywood right now. Yeah, I mean to be honest, I mean other than like like Hop, which I don't even really think you can count as animated. I mean I don't think Illuminations actually put out an actual like bad movie. Nope. I mean, are, are they revolutionary? Probably not, but they make consistent entertainment, and that's why they've been going so strong. And because of French tax credits, they can keep their movies, you know, under a hundred million dollars. Yeah, which, I, which which is is great that they can keep doing that. It... If only some other parts of the world could catch on to how to do things properly. Especially in animation. Well, because they're not France that will literally protest as a hobby. <laughs> it is a national pastime. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. But, uh, anyway, so, uh, gee, it sounds like America isn't great for large business. Mm. Um, what tips you off there? <laughs> depends on what part of the business you like. If you like uh, American people getting giant golden um, golden parachutes as they exit out of a bad situation, it's great for them! <laughs> and only them. Yeah. The rest of you guys can die. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, so... Uh, I, we, we haven't did our months at the beginning, but I don't really have anything to go on, so we can kind of just go off from there. But, uh, alright. That's it for this week. So we 
might have this kneeled down to bi-weekly now. We'll see if we're going to keep it at that. But anyways, um, Mike, where can everybody find you? You guys can find me on various social media sites at CaptainK42. You guys can check out my quick thoughts on letterbox.com slash CoachK42. And you can follow Renegade Pop Culture on Facebook and that place at Ren Pop Culture. You can also find us on YouTube, on Podchaser. Consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash Renegade Pop Culture. Listen to all of our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And last but not least, everything can be found at renegadepopculture.com. Need an escape? So do we. And Brie, where can I find it? Um, I'm at Crazy Lemur or Lemurs Rule One on most platforms. Um, but the spiciest spices that are apparently too hot for public consumption is uh, Twitter. And hopefully, I don't have a sinus infection in the next podcast. Hopefully not. You can find me everywhere at Organoid Zero, mainly on Twitch and YouTube. If anyone is a fan of Ruby whatsoever, especially Weiss or Blake, I will be giving away a Kara Ellerby Weissney autograph and a Blake Belladonna Aaron Zek autograph at the end of this month on my Twitch. All you need to be do is be subscribed and watching during the giveaway because you'll have a little thing where you can enter in your name and it's all automated and the computer decides who gets it. So... No favoritism, no nothing, but all right. We really need to catch up on Ruby. Uh, it, it's it's really good. It, it, it It's really good. It just got even up. The last few seasons are amazing, in my opinion. But yeah. All right, everyone. Until next time, we will see you all later. Peace. Bye.